Good hello, welcome to Onion Skin stream time. I'm going to be trying to build a rig as far as I can get in this session. No editing, no cuts, just so you can see the raw process of trying to get something from beginning to end. Uh, let me take you into it. Here, yeah, get, go away. Um, so this is for a pilot for um, Alice Mark of all people. Uh, this is just a simple character who only appears for about uh, three to five shots or so. Uh, and why I wanted to show this one off in particular, for one, I was granted permission to be able to do it, um, but there is a growing conversation amongst the Toon Boom and the rigging community uh, online, uh, as now there are more and more industry standard rigs available uh, for just user consumption. There's, there's qu quite a lot of really nice ones on Gumroad that you can sort of download, tear around and really dig into. And that's fantastic. I think that's wonderful. However, uh, as people are studying and learning rigging from that perspective, uh, we run the risk of only ever learning like one way to do it. People ask all the time, how do you rig? Ex expecting that there is just like a recipe that you can follow. When in reality, rigging is just as diverse and has just as much style to it as drawing itself. There's an infinite amount of ways to do it. And the way that you want to approach rigging for each particular project, each particular character can be unique, especially amongst the online community, people making shorts just for themselves, just for, you know, YouTube, TikTok, or uh, making music videos, or in this case, a an, an 11 minute pilot. Uh, when people are downloading the full 360 turnaround master controller style rigs, usually that's, frankly, it's overkill. <laughs> there is so much uh, going on that I think it can be quite intimidating for a lot of the, the amateur and the aspiring crowd because they think, oh man, do I need to go through this process of, you know, those characters can take a week and a half full time to build for a professional. That's pretty intense, right? If you're just making a two minute short, like, do you really need to give them that much functionality? Rigging is all about a return on investment. If this character is getting used for 20 episodes, hey, no worries. But this character I'm gonna be showing you today is only going to appear in five shots of, of this short. Uh, so we're gonna walk through the process together on how to choose our battles, basically. What decisions do we need to make to save time for us as a rigger, but also to save time for our animators, make sure that the tools that we are providing to that team are going to be useful, uh, is going to save them time. Uh, like we're giving them things they're actually going to use and we're not holding them back by giving them excessive features that they actually, frankly, don't even need. Uh, so predominantly, this is going to be more of like a like a live tutorial session, uh, stepping through that process. So, you know, catering for those who are watching this in post to flip back and forth among the timeline. Uh, but I will be diverting my attention to the uh, live audience um, where appropriate. So if you do have uh, questions or thoughts or just want to hang out, uh, definitely keep those flooding in. I promise I will try and keep up with them as I can, as we have... Uh, old favorites like Isaac and Kavi are here, which is fantastic. Um, so already we have uh, David the Gnome asking, is this the dude from uh, Brackenwood? No, this is, uh, that's Adam Phillips. Uh, those things are an absolute next level. Uh, so we're gonna be showing something a little bit simpler than that. Uh, what I've done so far uh, is just a little bit of prep work. Um, this, this is just the thumbnail that we're looking at right now. So let's get back to the regular display, which is blank. Uh, I've brought in a bunch of reference materials so we can see uh, the two poses that we'll be doing, which is a, a three quarter and a front facing pose. Uh, and let's have a quick look at the um, reference material that we've been provided as well, as well as the boards that they'll be appearing in. There we go. So this is the two poses that Alice Mark has drawn for us himself. So we can see the correct scale that they do work well together, uh, as well as any minute uh, detailed reference because you can see that this original one here has like spiky clothing but then he ended up having uh, rounded clothing in the end how about that uh, looking at the boards um, it's just a short sequence where we see him standing here uh, in a profile view there his main action is walking towards the camera in a full body shot uh, he gets in trouble for wearing his shoes I believe that's the gag so it's just sort of standing in three-quarter pose so pointing down at his shoes pants down as we see there, 
Uh, and then he gets heckled by a bouncer <laughs> who uh, has a good shout at him. And then we get this close up uh, shot of his shoes sort of wiggling around before he comes crashing down onto the floor like that. So that's the whole sequence. That's all we ever see of this character. So, you know, right away, we don't need to do things like uh, a rear view. We don't need to do a full, um, you know, full spin around. It doesn't need the full set of expressions, etc., etc. Uh, is there any angles that I can omit? Yes. Uh, this profile view here. Uh, this is just sort of thrown in for the board's sake. Um, at most, this is going to be a still image. So the animator can just draw that um, for that one pose. doesn't need to be rigged. It's just one image. Uh, they'd probably be able to save even more time if it turns out they just go with the three-quarter angle like with these guys, um, which for uh, knowing these boards is, is quite likely. Like there is a case to be made for going in that direction. So we're only going to be doing three-quarter and uh, front-facing. Uh, but let's consider the type of movement that we'll be doing as well. Um, the shoes are exceptionally detailed. Uh, well, let's, where's the color? Color one gone over. Where did I put it? Um, maybe I put it in the uh, turn. There we go. The, there we go. So the two color ones. Uh, so the front facing pose is only ever walking towards the camera and you can see the amount of detail going on in these shoes to try and make that a fully rigged element that people can bend, squash and move around is going to be bonkers. Uh, so <laughs> probably more detail than we actually need uh, at this time. Um, and for this one movement as well, giving an animator th this amount of shapes to work with, if they had to pose the laces, if they had to pose the soles, if they had to pose all this detail, Frankly, that is more detail than just drawing it. Just drawing it. So that's what we're going to be drilling into a lot today is where is the balance of hybrid? And there's going to be a lot of hybrid animation um, in this movement. I don't think that holds a, an animator back. In fact, I think they'll appreciate it. Uh, if they get a, like a torso that ends here and, it, and I say to them, hey man, the legs and the shoes, that's going to be traditional as they're wiggling around all crazy. Frankly, I think they're going to breathe, breathe a sigh of relief of just being able to draw that <laughs> rather than having to pose around a thousand different things that could all clash with their auto patches and just cause a whole bunch of issues. That'll cost me more time, it'll cost them more time, bleh. Um, the decision we're always trying to make uh, as riggers is where is the um, bell curve, right? Because we're trying to save animators time in the long run by automating a bit of their process. Um, but it is a bell curve. There is a point of diminishing returns where the amount of time we're saving for the animator starts to slow down and the amount of extra work as a rigger that we're putting in starts to get more and more. Eventually that efficiency straight up cancels each other out and we get to the point where it's taking longer to build and longer to pose than if we had just drawn it in the first place. And I think that's really important to keep in mind and I think that's something frankly that we should embrace. 2D animation, the whole point of this medium is that you can draw things, right? There is nothing more flexible and nothing will ever give you more control than just being able to draw straight from your imagination. You can create any shape that way. If we truly did get to the point where Harmony Rig could handle literally any pose that you can imagine, we might as well, let's be honest, just be doing a cel-shaded 3D production instead. And frankly, when you look at a... 3D rig compared to the really high-end 2D rigs. The 2D rigs are more complicated. <laughs> like they're, they're harder to build than a 3D one some of the time. Uh, so let's take advantage of the medium that we have. Uh, use rigged elements to save animation time and embrace hand-drawn uh, to get maximum control. So that rant aside, that's my thesis. Uh, looking at the five poses, um, let's have another quick look at the boards and see which parts actually need to be uh, built and which ones we do not need to build at all. Uh, I'm gonna quickly send us down to this board section here so I can red pen a little bit um, and write some notes for myself. And we'll see We'll see if some of you agree, right? Because <laughs> um, we've got two front facing ones here. Uh, this is all one shot there. And then we come back uh, at this pose, which is the same thing close up. So the way I'm seeing it is the body should be uh, that should be a rigged layer that is pretty much just a shape with an envelope on it. Pretty straightforward stuff. And the entire leg and shoes is just basically non-existent. The whole thing is um, traditional. We could consider making this leg a piece with an envelope or a curve around it. Um, but it's going to be taking on this kind of movement that it would probably be just as quick 
to draw it. So we might consider leaving it out completely. Um, the main movement that the three quarter pose does is gesturing with his arms. He brings his arms up and he points down. Similar sort of deal. They're quite stubby arms, quite stubby fingers as well. Uh, so in traditional industry standard rigs, you're sort of looking at two lozenge shapes uh, like this uh, that overlap one another and then the hands overlap one another again. And you have to deal with all the auto patching to cancel this stuff out. Uh, and that usually results in something looking quite puppety as well. It swings on the hinges and blah, blah, blah. And I think that could hypothetically work here. But again, this character exists for one movement. It's only ever going to be doing that, that one little pose. So I think we can just, you know, not do that <laughs> and have basically the body itself be a piece. I might separate some of the inner details so that the tie has the capability of doing some swinging, but everything below, all of this down here, I think can be one solid flat drawing. For the sake of future proofing it, because there might be some new shots added later on, the animator might want to take the extra mile and maybe do like a little bit of a shoe shuffle or something like that. I probably will separate the hips here uh, and patch those in because that won't be too much work. Uh, I don't want to overdo it because it's possible that it won't get used at all. Um, but that way I think we can try and maximize the balance between efficiency and control. Now the face is where things are gonna get a lot more interesting because it's highly expressive for these few moments. Uh, and we also have these two expressions to contend with, which is pretty full on for a rigs based thing. Uh, so I think on the most part, I'm gonna be dealing with this um, almost entirely rigged. All of these pieces here will get separated into their own parts. Um, you know, the mouth needs to be done in such a way that it's able to overlap this bit as well. I'm not gonna draw in these poses, but I need to be very confident that the animator is not going to feel any sort of strain or stress to be able to get these parts to be able to do this, right? Does that make sense? Um, that they should be able to stretch this ear to get it here. They should be able to stretch the mouth to get it here. Or they should also have the ability to uh, lop it off and redraw parts. So eyes, for example, they, can, they are very easy to like over rig where you would have the under eye be all the way down here and there would be an upper eyelid like that and they mask themselves into this, this space here like that. Similarly for the eyebrows, where this would be like an envelope deformer um, that masks away from this little bit of eye, this little bit of brow gets generated in and getting all of those things to balance is this, it's, it's like this wonderful Rubik's cube. It's a lot of fun to build, but it is pretty complicated when honestly, I think we might all have a nicer time if I just make this one drawing, <laughs> right? One flat drawing, so it is traditional eyes on top of a rigged head. I think it's gonna give us a lot more flexibility because then there's no wrestling with seven, eight, nine different parts when the eye suddenly needs to do this, when it needs to bulge out and get really extreme, uh, have these extra stress lines and things appear. I have the ability to do both and the animator has the ability to do both. I think that will work out quite well. So I think the only extra part I'm gonna have on top of the eye um, itself is just the pupil. That'll be the only thing independent of the rest of the structure. Uh, similarly with the mouth, I think that's just gonna be about layering uh, and masking it uh, in the right way. Whether or not it should be fully contained inside this head shape or have the ability to bleed outside of it, I'm not sure yet. We might have to cross that bridge when we come to it. Anyway, that's enough study uh, for now. I think I'm ready to go. Um, let's go back to our main turnaround and we'll start generating the main layers that we want. So with that in mind, we need to consider what layers to create uh, and which ones to leave out. Uh, some people like to create their layers as they draw. Personally, I like to do them all in advance because then when it comes to drawing in my parts, I can sort of switch that side of my brain off. I've already got a blueprint. I can just work straight towards it. Um, so let's consider what we've got. I said before, left and right leg uh, are going to be like combined with the shoes, traditional elements on a rigged uh, thing. So we'll have um, leg front, leg uh, back. While I do that, let's read some comments. Uh, David the Nose being very uh, active. Um, oh, and just responding to everything I've been saying before. So anyway, uh, keep any... Uh, thoughts coming in. If you disagree with anything I've been saying, I very much would like to hear it as well. Um, all right, so uh, arm front, arm back. 
I think I'll keep the tail separate as well because that won't be difficult to separate. Um, but this is where things are going to get really tricky. Should the body be one really long piece all the way up to the neck? Or should I separate it around the torso so that it's sort of capable of swinging around there? Um, I think for the front facing, maybe one piece is probably okay if I'm clever with my envelopes. So that would probably be good for the other one as well. Yeah, let's just do that. We'll have just one body and we can consider adding in other ones later. Uh, the collar and tie, they're masked in pretty cleanly. So uh, let's have all of them just be one layer for the time being as well. Um, maybe the tie could be its own thing, but we might cross that bridge when we come to it. Anyway, uh, the head's gonna have a few different parts though. So we've got the head itself, uh, ear front, ear back. It's got a lot of detail in there, um, but again, I don't think we need to break it down into too many subparts. Um, hair is probably worth having as three bits, so we can have the three curve deformers in there. I think that will be faster than trying to redraw it, so we'll call that hair one, hair two, hair three. Uh, as before, we've got just the eye with the pupil, not any of the eyelids and other junk. So I F, I back. Uh, pupil F, pupil back, uh, nose, mouth, and was that it? That can't be all of them already, can it? Possibly, because we are getting pretty simple. If all of the arms without, you know, hand, lower arm, upper arm, sleeve, shoulder, all of that's just being combined into one piece, it should save us a lot of time. Uh, also, considering that it's not unusual for large rigs to take over a week full time to build and ideally it'll be nice to try and get this done in less than a day uh, all right uh, this is probably one of the most inefficient parts of my method is that <laughs> although i like to create the nodes all in one go uh, there's not really any concise order that they appear in so now i've sort of just got to do a little bit of lego uh, shuffling these things around pupil front pupil back arranging them in the best way that I can. Uh, let's see, I, F goes there. Uh, nose is a part of the head. Hair two, hair three, that's there. I, B, that one goes there. Hair one goes there. Ear back, where's ear front? There it is. And we'll put the head itself. Uh, hang on, let's put the hair over here. Notice that I'm sort of clumping him in clumping them in a way where there's like little visual gaps between um, like types or clusters, things that would likely exist together. Um, and then we have, where is the head gone? I did create one, head, there it is. Uh, let's come down here to body, which will have both arms in front of that. The collar will, oh no, collar will go between the body and the arms in this arrangement, I think. Um, leg back, leg front, and tail at the very, very back. There we go. Um, all right. Uh, time to start drawing soon in a moment, I think. Uh, so I'll cluster, cluster these guys up. Two eyes together. Um, all of the stuff on top of the head, the two ears and hair. Um, Mouth and nose go onto the head itself. So I think I'll cluster those in that order instead. So the head can go here. And then all of the head stuff into one composite like that. And that's control H by the way, to generate composite. Um, let's put everything from the body together into one like that. Everything from the lower body together there. And then all of these composites into one and removed, there we go. Um, Okie dokie, time to get drawing. Um, so this is probably gonna be the, the biggest slog of the stream where there's not gonna be a whole lot to talk about. Um, and I'm also terrible at uh, chatting while drawing as well. 
so hopefully it's not just going to be silence for an hour. Um, but if you happen to watch this in post, then you can just, I don't know, skip ahead. Uh, where are we heading? Display that off. There we go. Now there's lots of ways to draw uh, with vector, of course, tons and tons of way. I could do a whole, whole session on that. Um, but I'm going to use my favorite method over the last couple of years, which is new as of Harmony 20. Uh, and that is the line tool. Um, and inside the tool properties for the line tool, there is these three uh, switches here. And the middle one is like this curvy one like that. And when I click and let go, uh, it does a little, you know, lets me sort of bend it. And then I click to lock it in. Uh, pretty cool. All right, uh, so how thick do we need this? Um, I should probably compare it to one of the other characters. <laughs> Um, but fortunately I can change it uh, in post. In fact, because as characters get closer to the screen, we're likely to make them thinner. Uh, I'm deliberately going to draw this much thinner than the reference material so I can be confident that the um, art is clean and that the vertices are connecting well. Um, I've got a spare node view up on the top here like this that just spans the whole vertical strip of my screen so I can easily grab bits. I'm gonna work my way from the right to the left, from the further, furthest most back layer to the furthest most front. Um, K for show strokes on, so I can visualize the structure. Uh, and here we go. Oh, that's very difficult to see, isn't it? Let's make it bright, bright pink or something. Make it black again later. Yep. Yeah, that'll do. All right, how's everyone getting on? Uh, Vinoda Time says that they didn't know I was working on this, and that's cool. Yeah, hello. <laughs> Good to see. Um, though I personally prefer frame-by-frame -frame animation, I've definitely grown an appreciation uh, to Flash and Toon Boom over the years, and seeing stuff like this get made is really cool and also new to me. That's uh, good to hear that you're starting to embrace it uh, more and more. Um, I definitely empathize uh, with the traditional animators who are sort of being pressed into having to learn this stuff because it's a very different mindset, isn't it? I would almost consider it to be a different medium, closer to uh, stop motion than to um, uh, hand-drawn almost. Golly, am I gonna save time by uh, using this tool? Because it's gonna be messing up some of my strokes. This is gonna take a while, if that's how long it took to draw a tail. <laughs> Uh, but then again, this character is a very clinical style. Um, now this one is going to have a joint with the body. So let's use the circle to make sure that it can be true. Be able to pivot cleanly. How thick is it? It is a very thick leg. Uh, that'll do. Remember to always, always, always uh, shrink the circle and fill it as a pivot reference for later. There we go. Really like this bendy line tool because I can be really precise about where things touch. Keep a good eye on my intersections and junk like that. Uh, Pinetto, would you mind telling us a little bit more about your experience uh, using Harmony and Rig-based stuff so far? Uh, what sort of things have you been uh, working on? Like, were you really thrown into the deep end with some some of the really full-on 360 builds? Were you able to sort of like uh, ease your way in? Like, what's been some of the biggest hurdles and then uh, like what changed after you got used to it? Uh, those shoelaces are going to be interesting. I should probably consider putting those on their own layer. I'm not quite sure how clinical Mark wants the art to be either. A circle like this, 
might stand to actually deliberately add a little bit of imperfection into it. Should probably switch back to the sketch as well, considering I gotta get the arky detail rather than the spiky detail. Um, I think this is best constructed with pencil or shift key. I think I'm gonna have no choice but to build it. Go around like that, around there. Uh, yeah, I have a feeling that's meant to be more round than it's drawn. And then one of my favorite tools, selecting all this and pressing the sticky tape to fuse them all together into one. And then the cutter tool to trim off the excess. There you go, that's pretty, pretty good. Um, now, those laces being separate, I probably don't need to because I really think that this is going to be just one piece that never never moves at all. So screw it. We can have that be one. Oh my goodness, my line art is awful. What's happened to my roundness? You see that? Fortunately, a little tug smooths right smooths right up. I can't draw in Photoshop anymore because of things like this. Here we go. Um, oh, you've only done independent shorts frame by frame. Uh, so seeing it get uh, built from this direction, um, how does it uh, make you feel if it's something that you don't have experience with, but it's, you know, like, cause it's been fascinating, if it's fascinating to like watch come together, um, if you were thrown into the scenario where you had to animate this way, um, do you reckon you'd be able to embrace it or it will be a bit intimidating? Uh, let's put that shoelace up there instead. Here we go. Notice it's got a bit of tapering as well. I think I might uh, do that now. Have it thin out just a little bit so that when we bolster up the whole line, we'll notice a difference. There we go. Uh, and get rid of that edge as well now we get that sure that should rotate just fine uh, and if we're really lucky we might just might be able to take this vector right across to the other leg in fact i'm almost sure we can oh wait hang on i need to make that line less gross Ooh, how awful hooray grab oh wait i did the whole thing on the <laughs> i drew the whole thing onto the back leg whoops um all right well i guess we can just copy it straight across onto leg f then and then leg b let's push you across and hope for the best it's definitely an independent drawing but um uh, well <laughs> yeah now that leg's in a completely different spot isn't it What happens if I grab this and push it back? Yeah, no, that's definitely got to be be done fresh. Oh, it was worth a try. Maybe I can skew it across. Interesting that it's such a different height. I wonder how precious that is uh, to the you know to the vision. Oh, hello. I just realized that this crease here isn't actually a shoelace. It's a crease of the shoe itself. Um, I think I might try polyline this time. Over we go. Seems to be a real love it or hate it tool, the polyline here. How do you feel about the polyline? Or the pen tool, depending on your background. Interestingly, it tends to keep each stroke separate, so you still got to sticky tape them afterwards. Tape this one in as well, like that. Um, and 
this last piece should be curvable like that. Okay, um, just like last time, I think I'll construct this one with bent lines, sticky tape them afterwards. There we go. Making decent time so far, but must consider if the animator is going to frame by frame this sequence. Are they just able to do cleanup like way faster than this? Because like, goodness, <laughs> what a slog if you had to do 80 frames of this. Um, I'm hoping that it can be built in such a way that uh, the animator will be able to take this initial keyframe and be able to do duplicate drawing and then like warp and bend things on a vector level um, at best and then like just only have to redraw certain portions of it frame by frame rather than the whole lot. I've been seeing a lot of um, uh, traditional Harmony productions lately really embrace that workflow in particular, actually. Uh, it's been quite quite inspiring. It almost feels like a bit of a pseudo rigging method. Like the whole character is just on one layer and they're just picking up and bending vector art around frame by frame. But it's a really similar like mindset and philosophy, um, if you will. Um, Pinata goes on to say, um, frame by frame, especially cell animation is just so cool to watch. The appeal is that there's lots of mistakes and it's noticeable when things are right. Just ironically feels right to me. Yeah, I really agree. Um, there's something really, um, organic about traditional frame by frame. I think it in invites the audience in a little bit more, um, sort of being able to embrace those imperfections and things like that. And it's something that as an industry, we've had to confront a little bit, um, as like HD or, you know, dare I say 4K has come into play um, because those imperfections and things unfortunately are less forgiving than they once were. Um, when you really blow things up, uh, there's like a little bit of a charm to the wobble, but when it's in HD, it's actually distracting. Um, which is probably why you've noticed an uptick in shows becoming, uh, having a more and more of a clinical look over the years. And there's an argument to be made that that's taken a lot of the soul away. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a balance to be found somewhere, I think. Oh, what about us? How did I taper the line? Great question. Um, so if you need to taper a line in posts and to do it manually by hand, um, rather than using a pressure sensitive pencil, of course, which is probably the quickest way underneath the white arrow, the third tool down is this the pencil editor. And it allows you to get to the vertices around the edge of a stroke. So I can sort of pick that up and make it thinner and thicker. Um, and there's a couple of shortcuts to keep in mind with that. Um, if you press control, you can add in a new set of points. So it's difficult to see against red. Sorry. Um, there you go. Uh, so you can see this added two new points, but it hasn't added one in the middle. So I can make it thicker here, but it's not going to influence um, the direction of the line, which is pretty handy. Uh, the other thing it can do is if you hold shift, it will perform like a twin movement, make both sides thicker and both sides thinner, um, which creates this like weird wedge shape. But you'll notice that it also has busy handles on it. So if I hold shift again and sort of give that a little bit of a turn, uh, it evens it out and gives us a much more satisfying um, uh, taper. And if you really want to save time, it's possible to save this as a preset so that as you draw lines later, it will automatically be applied. Um, if you look down in the presets for um, all of the stroke tools, uh, most of them are indeed in there. Uh, so for example, down here, there's like this one where it's like thin in the middle and thick at the ends. Now that's just a preset of that tapering I just showed you. So if I draw a straight line, there you go. See that? It just sort of like squeezes out the middle. Um, so that's meant to sort of like simulate, you know, like a fast drawing um, pen, which the program has gotten like actual features for now with uh, speed based pressure. <laughs> Uh, but if we have a look at the uh, tapering there, you can see what it's done. Pretty neat. 
Uh, anyway, back to where was I? Uh, maximum size 100%, thickness level 4. Hiya. Uh, now everything's yellow. That's okay. I'll work with that for a bit. Um, this leg needs to go all the way back and marry up with that one there. That'll do. Uh, like the other leg, going to give this a pivot reference by making it small, filling it with uh, green, filling it with green. Oh my goodness, fill it with green. There we go. Uh, get rid of the outer edge and then make that real small so it's super obvious on where to put the pivot so that has a perfectly uh, center swing or some junk. Um, oh, this is still missing one last line. At the top of the shoe, about here. Uh, there we go. In you get. Oh, that's not touching. Always keep an eye out for your yellow, yellow dots. So you know if it's intersecting with the rest of the stroke and indeed the paint bucket will work. Oh my goodness. Okay, legs and tail are done, except for the, except for the fluffy bits. I should probably get that going now before I get too deep into this. Where were they kept? I thought I did have one inside the reference material itself. Um, where are you? Three quarter front facing and that was it. How bizarre. I thought for sure that there, I know that there is one, where is it? Um, this front facing here I'll put a mat on it. So yeah, there's the three quarter with the lumpy edges. Now, why aren't you on the first frame? Let's, let's do that. Frame one, keyframe. Uh, turn you off. Find me for a second. Bring the mat across and make that visible again. Keyframe that across to here. There we go. All right. Now we can get that texturing in as well. Great. How exact is that? Is it exact enough? Yes. Um, but as it says, flush just looks uh, too perfect. Uh, yeah, so too clinical, right? Um, it's good and appealing, but frame by frame is just what I've always loved. Uh, and there's a lot more room to explore there, I think. Um, because you can start getting into all sorts of interesting brushes and um, you know embracing scratchy, scratchy looks. You get a lot more emotion, I think. Um, the tricky bit I find when you upscale it to full size production is drawing the limit on how much each artist can embrace their individuality, if that makes sense. Um, so when things are super clinical looking, it's a lot easier to have a style that everyone can conform to, like everyone knows the rule and how it should look. Uh, but when there is, uh, when, when you can embrace things getting a little bit messier, things can get really messy. <laughs> uh, well, not so much messy, but like bizarrely inconsistent, if that makes sense. Um, um, and there are some productions where it gets noticeable, like from scene to scene, you can see it shifting between different artists and, and the different ways that they draw. Uh, and it can be hard to keep a lid on, like how do you get things loose, but still make sure it doesn't get too far out there. And, um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Um, you, on the opposite end of that extreme, you've got the like online maps and, you know, collabs and things where it's all about embracing how unique each animator gets. And I think they're a lot of fun. Um, 
And I sometimes wonder if it would be plausible to pull off a 20 episode season of a show <laughs> like that, or if it would just be so jarring uh, that you couldn't get through it. Um, um, but you go on to counter me and say, I kind of like when it's uh, distracting, at least uh, with older cell stuff. I suppose uh, seeing mistakes in digital shows is a harder pill to swallow. Um, for example, I liked how far OKKO OK went off, mm. uh, but that's because it was exaggerations, uh, not going off model for a whole episode. It's like some shows look different from, uh, episode to episode. Um, yeah, so some shows, um, embrace that very much. Like I remember it, um, like Steven Universe would sometimes be a little bit controversial like that. Like some, some viewers enjoyed it. Some people didn't. Um, because it was such a, a, a board driven, uh, show. And I think it worked out quite well, uh, in its favor, honestly. Um, uh, but I can understand why it's not everyone's cup of tea for sure. Um, where you've essentially got the, the border is more or less the, the script writer. Uh, and when you're outsourcing that look, um, it, go oh, sorry. Uh, when you're outsourcing it. Uh, the outsource studio just sort of works to the boards, right? Um, so it's been becoming increasingly more common over the years that board artists are taking on a lot more responsibility than they once needed to. Rather than just focusing on, you know, the story and the acting, they're having to think about um, being on model and uh, timing and all sorts of interesting things um, as they've started having to, you know, do their own animatics or, uh, you know, you animate straight from the animatic and you, you know, draw straight over those models. Uh, so there's like a consequence to a board artist not drawing on model. Um, but that takes up quite a bit of mental real estate that they probably um, shouldn't always be having to think about because they also have to think about the story beats and the flow of gestures and expression and things like that. Um, and when you're getting down uh, to a micro level of getting every dang keyframe on model, whew, that's, a, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of things to be thinking about. Um, so it's fascinating to see how each studio and um, production will experiment with the roles and responsibilities of that department. Uh, and if they will bring in... Uh, other departments in between to sort of like wedge the gap. Like, will they have tie downs? Will they have character layout? Uh, and you get all sorts of different results with, with each one. Um, I'm not sure if there will ever be uh, a consensus on such a thing uh, because you, you get different kinds of stories told, I suppose. Um, and we're in a time where the technology continues to uh, evolve and shift uh, quite radically so there's always a lot of pioneering and innovation going on uh, and I think that's okay too honestly I've been meaning to put out a bit of a a disclaimer on my videos as well because you know how I do a lot of um ex shall we say experimenting here where I mess around with a lot of unconventional features and things like that I don't want to accidentally um misconstrued anyone to thinking that this is the way that you should always be using the program um, and therefore take such methods into a studio environment because uh, I'm just going to start at kind of the place where a lot of the time I get to mess around uh, with stuff that I don't get to do during the day. The stuff that you very rarely, if ever, see um, on a proper production because it, it, it just doesn't scale to a, to a full team. Um, or for a full 20 minute script. Um, but there may still be undiscovered tools that can uh, help with that sort of thing. Um, and you're never going to be able to describe, um, discover it when you just need to meet the next deadline, you know? Sorry, I'm rambling. <laughs> uh, Panita. Panita has more to say. Uh, I'm big on continent models. Uh, I just want some variety um, within shots. More wacky poses than still shots. 
Um, yeah, no, that's cool. I totally agree. Uh, I'd very much like to see more of that as well. Uh, people who say all animation should be done in flash and all frame by frame uh, is very weird to me. Like you said, it's so different. Can't we have both? Yes, I absolutely think we can have both. Um, I don't think I've ever heard the point of view of everything should be in flash. <laughs> um, I probably hear a lot more people thinking that they want more frame by frame. And there's definitely a lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, when it comes to how rigs work and what they're capable of. Uh, because we've reached a point now where you can almost seamlessly recreate uh, traditional looks with rigs. Now, now that doesn't mean we should be using them for everything, um, but it does mean that rigging and riggers have probably more of a responsibility on production as a whole uh, than many would stop to consider, if that makes sense. Because um, there's a lot of time always is given to conceptual design, but I'm not, at least in my experience, I haven't seen too many give a lot of time to conceptual rigging or conceptual animation. Like, let's try and get these characters moving with like five or six different methods uh, and discover together what is the best, how do we get the best balance of efficiency and quality for this particular project, you know what I mean? Because uh, like normally by the time you get the riggers involved, the decision has already been made <laughs> and you kind of just need to get on with it uh, and do as you're told, which is why I really like projects like this, uh, doing a pilot, uh, because there is still, um, like those larger creative decisions are still being made uh, and there is room to sort of explore and discuss and argue and uh, decide together, how should we get this going? Um, it's chaotic because a lot of the time you make the wrong decision and you have to bear the consequences of that um, because everything's easier in hindsight, right? How do you handle all of this when it's a, when it's still a blank page? You don't actually know what's going to work yet until after you've done it. Uh, and you keep those lessons in your back pocket for next time. Mm -mm -mm. Um, I would like to see more productions that, like, on that argument of, you know, are we arguing for all flash or, so like, all rigged or all um, frame by frame? Um, I'd like to see more productions sort of consider their movement style first and almost work backwards. <laughs> like, could you design your characters after that? That'd be interesting um, because depending on the approach that you take, the way that you design your character, like, like there's different challenges involved in uh, the shapes of your characters. Like we're all familiar with how in traditional, uh, the more detail they have, the longer they're going to take to draw. So if they've got like a thousand belts and zippers on them, then you're going to be in for a bit of a rough time. Uh, but for rig base, it's kind of the opposite. You can have as, almost as much detail as you want because you're bending around a pre-existing drawing. Um, it's joints where things get difficult. So something as simple as having a band-aid on the knee is going to make things trickier than they otherwise would have been. Uh, and then there's projects where it's say like based on a toy franchise <laughs> where it was designed to be a figurine before it was designed to be on screen. And oh boy, those are, uh, those are something else. Trying to get those built and moving. It's a fun challenge, but like, yeah, you probably wouldn't design the character that way if they were um, to be on screen first.
Hey, thank Drex. Backgroundart.net. Good to see, you, man. Yeah, those uh, those rigs were pretty wild. I need to get you on here sometimes to talk more backgrounds. Um, I feel like the subject matter of what I get to talk about is um, is getting limited. Because I've still got quite a bit of drawing left to go. Yes, yes, I get it. <laughs> um, did you actually want to pop on for a bit, by the way, Greg? Um, want to voice chat, keep his company while I finish all this drawing? does take priority. Best of luck. Looking forward to the next one. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Why am I drawing this like this? Oh, look how tapered that is. Interesting. It's almost to a point. other thoughts or comments i know it's, it's been a while since um i've uploaded uh so if there's anyone watching you has um suggestions or particular snags they've been hitting lately uh in their animation or in harmony or whatever i am more than happy to take uh quick tangents on this from time to time to help you out by the way uh, it's one of the real benefits of these, because if you send a suggestion or a request for like for a video, it's it's very possible I'll say like, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll add it to the pile, and then I'll never get round to it because that pile is enormous, and uh, the upload schedule is non-existent. Um, oh, Drex has one. Fantastic. Do you ever have the problem in Toon Boom where the program forgets the shortcut keys you set? Yes, I do. Um, in fact, it's happening to me right now because I have shortcuts set up for switching between the art layers. But when I press that shortcut, it's not doing anything. Uh, likewise, I've got them for um, paint bucket. Normally I hold the three key down and then it should paint bucket, but it's not doing it right now. And I don't know why. Um, so, Yes, I relate to your problem, and I wish I had an answer, <laughs> but um, no, I can't. I can't think of it off the top of my head, because um, like I've got my own like preset one set up in there, uh, and if I was to search for one of them, uh, let's see, like that one I just said, three is the paint bucket. Rotate tool. That's not right. It's meant to be the paint bucket tool. 
paint and remove texture. Uh, is it called paint bucket? Yeah, paint tool. Alt I, that's not right. If I press this, will it change back? Toon Boom Studio 2020. Or is paint tool the brush tool? I don't know, 2020. Something's shifting around there. What's it doing? I spent a lot of time making some custom shortcuts, so I don't know why it's not working for me. Um, it is called, yeah, yeah, it is called the paint tool. So it should be three, but it's not. Oh, wait, wait, that's because I got something else selected. Um, it started happening to me when I switched the preset to Toon Boom Studio keys. Interesting, um, because I'm like you. I much prefer the Toon Boom Studio shortcut set. Maybe that's just because what I got my start with. I think they're brilliant. Um, but there's a, I, I customize it quite dramatically on top of that. And I have a bunch of macro keys as well. Um, yeah, I, I really need to dig around and have a, uh, hopefully I can get back to you on that. Because I discovered recently um, that preferences can be similar. And I think I know how to get around that one. Uh, Pinata says, I found you because of read between the frames. Um, but I do like watching how these rigs are made. It's funny you should mention that. I very nearly released a video um, the other week uh, doing a read between the frames study of the the Will Smith slap. But then, unfortunately, one, it took me way too long to make uh, and because it was going to be an April Fool's Day thing. And April Fool's went and came and went. So it's like 85% finished. And now it just feels like I don't know, probably not very appropriate to be uploading it. Um, but also I found out that someone else made a video that is exactly the same subject subject matter, doing a um, an animation study of, of that moment. Oh no, now my regular shortcuts are gone. Oh, this is awful. <laughs> What's happened? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll end up uploading that as a, um, as like a Patreon extra. Uh, for those guys, because they haven't had uh, any extra bits for a couple of months, which is not very good value. <laughs> Join the Patreon. <laughs> You'll get hardly anything, apparently. Oh, Mortimer at Havanessa. The shortcut problem usually seems to resolve when you restart the program. Only a couple of times I've had to go to the shortcuts to reset them. Interesting. I wonder if that's worth trying. Maybe later. Um, all right, so this back arm, because it's also temporary, I think I'll just sort of leave it as a bit of a clump. Um, notice they all got yellow dots, so they're all separate. Stick your tape to join them. Uh, and then cut a tool to trim, 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 trim. Uh, by the way, Greg, assuming uh, you're still hanging around to uh, listen, um, I wonder if we should have a bit of a challenge of trying to get you to paint something in harmony and see how it goes. Because like, because I haven't used any other tools now for like literally years. Um, it would be really fascinating to go down your road and see how clip studio paint and stuff works. Like how, how jealous should I be of other programs? Um, and are there any secret benefits that you're missing out on by not doing it straight in here? Because from what I understand, the main thing that Harmony can't do in regards to bitmap management uh, is smudge tool style stuff. But that's about it. Um, like being able to push and liquefy pixels around. Uh, but when it comes to like managing your clipping masks and your blending layers and things like that, um, again, that little bit of little bit of node view expertise, uh, I think, could go a really long way uh, for a background artist. <laughs> Hopefully, we we'll get around to it one day. What I'd be more interested to do together, though, is just a um, uh, like a background critique stream where you give me a couple of exercises to try as a non-background artist 
and I'll give them a go. And then you just tear me to shreds. Like you give me notes in the same way that you would for one of your team members. Um, but like basically go full Gordon Ramsay. Like, because I'm not a, like, I'm not a background artist at all. But if someone who was a professional background artist were to turn in work of that quality, <laughs> what would you do to that person? Oops. Yeah. Oh, wonder if it'll be time to take a break soon for some uh, activities or some, you know, quick quick drawing challenge or five minute animation or something like that. What do you think? I want to see more of that 10 minutes rigging challenge. Oh, good timing if I just sent that. Um, that that's an interesting suggestion. Um, I, I sort of held back from that sort of thing because um, I, I am really wrestling with giving uh, a, a bad information or bad advice to people um, because the idea of rigging something in 10 minutes sounds exciting, but that's not something that should be embraced, <laughs> right? Um, most professional rigs, again, they take about a week full time to make. Um, so when I've had uh, uh, animators or riggers come up to me saying, um, you know, sort of asking for advice um, or sort of like applying for positions and things like that, um, when they say that they're able to build a rig from start to finish in half an hour, I'm not seeing that as a strength, right? I'm just like, okay, um, that's okay. They, they're clearly not like industry level if you're, if you're making them that, that quickly. Um, it's more about being able to work. Uh, yeah. I, I'm almost wondering if this almost falls into that category of this is what a fast rig looks like because I'm building it. Um, in just one afternoon, more or, more or less, as opposed to it being a many day uh, affair. Um, the actual best balance that I really would like to explore more for silly videos and things, and yeah, maybe we should take a quick break and do one right now, just as a bit of fun, um, is exploring hybrid animation a bit more. Um, where it is all about balancing that frame by frame and, you know, with a bit of pegs, with a bit of deformers here and there to save time on emphasizing that movement. Um, so should we do one? Like if you have any, like a uh, bit vague, isn't it? Um, let's have a couple of topics on something that I can spend 15 minutes uh, animating from start to finish and we'll see how we go. Um, now, should I start with a shape? Should I start with a node type? Um, hmm. I'll answer a few more comments and then we'll see. Um, Greg says he doesn't really do Gordon Ramsay style to anyone. That's probably good. We don't want you verbally abusing any of the stuff. Uh, at most, I sign them easier paints. Uh, they can't really mess up. That's. That's, that's very kind of you. Is there any advice you could give on organizing layers in a populated scene for a newcomer? Uh, yes, I can. Um, what tier are you using, uh, Gaming Maniac? Do you have access to the node view or are you in Essentials and Advanced where it is strictly organizing layers? Uh, and while we wait for that, meanwhile, we got... Uh, Cha Cha Charlie awaits says, Hey, I'm kind of late here. I uh, just want to say thanks for all the content you upload. It's helped me a lot. Thank you very much. It means a lot, especially when I haven't uploaded in three months. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I often worry that there's 
very large gaps in the information that I provide. Uh, please let me know if there is something that you need and you are struggling to find resources on. Fortunately, people like Zuberbrain are filling in all of the gaps. <laughs> Uh, Jack says, any tips on compositing 2D rigs on live action backgrounds? What resolution um, would be your background so you don't see pixels when you zoom in? Uh, I think Greg will have the answer to that on how big a background should be. Um, we've been talking about that um, together quite a bit lately on how far can you get a background in before you need to do a repaint of it. Basically, if it's a, if it's a live action background, then I guess you should just be shooting at 4K or it's just as high as you can as you can possibly get. Um, ah, Gaming Man X says I am using Premium currently. I wanted uh, the ability to use a wider selection of tools. Fantastic. Um, all right, so arranging your layers, um, it's it's about a composite balance basically. Um, you don't want to overdo it. It's difficult to overdo it, but when you've got like a crowd shot of like seven or eight densely rigged characters, uh, it is possible. <laughs> um, but you can see at this one at the moment, I'm using my composites because the pegs aren't in there yet um, to sort of uh, categorize shapes. Um, so we've got um, left eye, right eye, um, mouth, nose, and head, and all of the hair. So like all of that is going into one mass um, head composite. Then I've got the lower body stuff, body, collar, upper arm, lower arm, and then uh, the two legs and tails, they're going into a composite as well. Um, so by putting them into that, that's going to make layer management way easier for me. Um, so now rather than having to take all of these head layers and move all of them down below the legs, they all come into one thread. So at the moment they're at the top. And if I just put it there, there we go. All of the head stuff is now behind them. Um, so don't feel shy about using lots of composites at the beginning. If you start to feel the program starting to slug a little bit, you might be starting to overdo it and it's time to delete some. Um, but when you're working on it, I, yeah, I, I'm not shy about having uh, lots of composites. I usually just tidy them up before I have to hand them off to an animator. Um, but when I'm working on them, they're really useful tools. Um, ah, Greg says for TV, it's standard to paint backgrounds in 4K uh, plus some buffer space around the camera. Uh, if your background has a zoom or a cut in, uh, we never go closer than 1920 by 1080. So it doesn't go blurry at HD. Um, so yeah, I guess that means if you're painting at 4K, then you've got, you can zoom into like one quarter that size, which is pretty far. Um, but then you also, uh, keep in mind, um, to Charlie that you are, um, uh, wait, hang on. Who was asking that question? It was Drex, I think. Um, that you also have to contend with line thickness at that point. How far in can you zoom in on a background before the lines of that background have become thicker than your character? Mm. Uh, all right, where was I? Uh, arms are done, collar is done. Uh, the main body is there. I don't think we've done the hair. We've got body, got the collar, got the both arms. All right, hair. Unfortunately, don't have to really worry about the highlights. That's going to save some time. Golly, the inking process really does take a little while, doesn't it? Uh, hair two. Notice that these ones are going right down to the base of the head. Uh, and making sure that they've got plenty of crossover uh, so that when they're layered, um, there's no problem there. Uh, and going uh, much deeper into the head than that. There we go. Um, oh yeah, we did the rear ear. Um, does it need this bit? I don't think so. Uh, front ear. Now I'm probably not gonna have time to do the front facing uh, angle today. It's starting to look like. So I guess I should m move into actually rigging this guy as soon as possible so that this entire session isn't just tracing stuff. How dull. Eh, eh, eh. That needs to be a little bit pointier. Oh, by the way, um, get excited as well uh, because I th I'll likely be doing one more character um, and uh, 
Mark said he is happy to come uh, join and hang out for that session. Uh, so that'll be great. Uh, he's at a con today though, so not around today. Yep. This one's gonna need a little bit of fixing. Um, Gaming Manic says, uh, right now I'm working on my first animated short and it's definitely getting messy. How is it going? Is there anything that we can see? Like if it's, if it's a personal project, you're allowed to show us, right? Um, like, would you mind if I plugged it? Like, like if it's a work in progress, um, like all good if you don't want to show it yet. Um. But I want to see. I want to see how messy it's getting. You know, <laughs> that's fun. I think I, uh, I've still got the screenshots lying around somewhere from my um. High school short, uh, and just the state of my desktop by the end of that project, and just how insane it got. Because yeah, it was like first experience with um. Uh, managing something of that density. Um, and when you go well past the threshold of being clean, you know, it was the epitome of final, final version 17, definitely final 23, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. I don't think I need to have that line go all the way around the edge. I could spend ages messing around with auto patches to get it to work, but fortunately it looks like the edge is masked by the ear here. So I can just, you know, not do it. And get that somewhere in the middle. Um, this one needs to be tapered as well. In you get. There we go. Pencil editor. This sort of cleanup is uh, quite therapeutic. It's normally what you put on a audio book in the background or something. <laughs> uh, dot net says. Uh, in reply to Gaming Maniac that yes, we have a rule um, on the show that he and I are on together at the moment, um, where we don't zoom in much closer than 2,600 pixels wide uh, as it makes the uh, lines ugly thick. Um, Twitch Drex says, if I were to make rigged characters, um, uh, a rigged character to hand off to an animator on a student project, what controllers do you think would suffice uh, trying to make it easy for the animator. Um, so very similar to what I'm doing here. If you're handing something off to an animator on a um, student project, basically just shapes with envelopes is all you need. Um, so have pegs on parts. Um, and so like this head, for example, is just gonna have envelopes around the edges and that's it. Um, so that no master controllers, no like external weird switches or anything like that. No constraints, um, no over the top like transformation switches. Like there's no need to get clever with it. Um, it's just, just shapes. <laughs> um, if depending on your style, uh, if it's not too late, um, I would highly encourage that you go lineless because then you just don't need to worry about auto patching at all. You can just have layers stacked on top of one another and it just doesn't matter how things are laid. Um, whereas as soon as outlines are involved, you do have to worry about the art sub layers and auto patching things in so that, you know, you can manage elbows properly and you have to start animating in Z space to bring things forwards and backwards. Things get really complicated and don't get me started on colored outlines. Oh boy. Uh, anyway. Um, all right, Gaming Manx says, uh, I'd love to show some. Can I add a picture uh, in YouTube live chat or should I send it uh, to the Discord? Um, also, just to look at the actual animation uh, or my atrocious layering so far. I would like to see both. I think the Discord is probably the best place to send it and then I will um, 
just bring that monitor over onto onto my screen, um, which would be a good thread to put that in though. Um, I suppose in the show off your work section still, and I'll maximize it to not accidentally show things that other people put in because they don't want it up. Um, I always find it harder to rig from the head down, easier from the feet going up. Um, yes, I agree. The, the absolute master should be at the base. Um, so the way that this one's going to go eventually um, is all of the head stuff gets grouped together. Um, all of the upper body stuff is rigged together. Head is parented to the upper body here. Um, and then at the very end, the lower body is parented here, like that. Um, and then the whole thing is controlled via the base. But you can notice I haven't actually added any um, hierarchy or rigging yet. Um, it depends on the project. Because um, this is sort of like a, like a mid-tier rig sort of thing, uh, where I, like I know what the goal is and what I need to do. Um, so I'm preparing all of the shapes in advance. If we're going full hybrid animation style, then um, I would probably build as I draw. Uh, and when it's like a full on 361, it's it's pretty similar to this. Where it's the, all the drawings start first and I try and plan it out as, as well as I can to avoid any super weird surprises. Um, but I have a feeling that can only really come with uh, practice and experience to know what parts need to exist and how it all gets laid. I'm not sure how you would figure all that out in advance without um, winging it a few times first. Any tips for file management and fol uh, folder layout for a short film? Yes. Um, did you do like a storyboard or an animatic first? Uh, and particularly, did you do it in Storyboard Pro? <laughs> um, doesn't really matter, but like there's tools in that that definitely make it easier because it's so compatible um, with Harmony. Um, but basically you want to have uh, one document per shot and you want to have a naming convention that looks something like this um, something like project name so like acronym of whatever it is you're doing on um, if it's a short film you could probably get away with just having the shot number all the way through um, you're, you're probably this deep in already but there's, there's sort of like two tiers you can just have, have your shot number or you can have sequence number at first so um, so that sequence is like your scenes. So you'd have like 001 and then like 001 again. Um, so like have it, have enough zeros in there to start with so you don't need to um, fill it up later. Oh, hang on. I'm getting some lag. People are microwaving. I'll be back in a moment. My internet goes down. I have been muted. I've been, oh my, oh no, how long have I been muted for? I've been asking if the lag has reduced itself and I've been back to you guys being able to hear me for a while. <laughs> like a while. <laughs> because like YouTube brought up its things being like, ah, oh, okay, like connection restored, but... Um, it was like a crunchy video feed. So I was like, oh, okay. I need to get like a confirmation from the chat that I am back uh, and I can start talking about other things again. Um, and I was like, oh, Drex, did you still want me to talk about um, naming conventions and folder management and stuff? And I asked that like four or five times and you never replied. So I was like, oh, I guess you're just not interested anymore. Oh, well. Um, but I was muted. I put myself on mute for the couple of minutes that the microwave was going on and I never turned the dang thing off again and never even checked. Um, 
until Greg asked if I went mute. I said, oh man, I'm such an idiot. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, <laughs> just before uh, I talk about that, uh, Drex, you're also asking what the experience has been like at uh, Princess Bento. It's been lovely. I'm still there. Um, they can be very busy, which is why I haven't been able to upload a whole lot. Um, but it's like a good busy. Um, I'm it, like it's it's purely on me for not uh, figuring out um, how to manage both at the same time. Hopefully, I'll get there. I wasn't even sure if I had announced publicly that I am uh, working there. How did you find out? Um, uh, but while you answer that, um, for managing your folders and files, um, if it's for a student film, how many other animators are you working with? Who do you need to communicate for? And, uh, things like that because um, I was saying before they like normally you want like project name and then you'd either have uh, s like sequence and then shot but if it's a short film where it's only a few minutes you probably get away with just having a shot number make sure you have enough zeros in there to compensate so it, it, like it'll file itself in order um, then after that it can usually be a good idea to have your stage number written down after that so like what that is like um like what's happening right now like is it is it up to rough is it is it, is it up to clean up um you know steps like that um do you need to like have a layout phase so then you can sort of like see at a glance from the ju just from the naming in your folder um what step everything is currently on um without having to have like you know, extensive databasing and junk like that. Um, and it also means that everyone is rhythmically doing a save as at every step. So it's really good for backing up. They can get all through to old stages if you need to. Um, and then finally, uh, you would have a version number like that. Um, so forget having, you know, final, final version 17, 26, just have VO1 and just, just keep ticking that thing up ever and ever and ever. Um, and then uh, very subjective on if you want that ticker to reset back to version one when it upgrades to the next step, um, or if or if this is just a universal parameter of, of how many times that um, thing has been basically opened. Like, like I know some projects, they will version that up like every morning, regardless on whether or not it's like gone through a round of notes or not. Um, personally, I think I like to reset it at each stage, uh, and then it versions itself up whenever there's a round of notes. Um, so if, you know, you fix it and then do some more and whatever, um, then you can always come back. Uh, and then whether or not you want to have like the date after that or not, whatever. Anyway, uh, the, the main rule is that you want to have most generic to least generic so that if it's ordered alphabetically, it's just going to like pull itself up. Um, but definitely lean on having one document per shot. Uh, people who come from Flash, there's like this thing where they really want to try and condense an entire project into one great big document. I think that's a horrible idea. <laughs> like, like, don't be ashamed to like, or don't be shy to like break it down to like atomic parts. Uh, and then you lean on Harmony's library system to be able to access heavily reused items. So if you've got backgrounds, they get used a lot. You've got characters that get used a lot. Then you can just assemble again each time and it's, and it's just fine. Uh, it makes it way easier to assemble in post as well. Um, especially for a short film where you're likely um, the director as well. Um, have a think about if you want people to be exporting things on a shot level or be exporting things on a layer level, right? So on my personal projects, when I'm just working for me or for a client, um, I have lots and lots of write nodes. Um, I always export things with a write node as an image sequence per layer. So rather than just pressing export movie and the shot comes out, every character comes out by itself as a PNG, PNG sequence. And then I assemble everything together properly in my editing software. And the reason for that as a, as a solo creator, when you're watching your, your short back and you're finding all of the things that are busted and things that you need to fix, it's really easy to go back and fix just little things. Because you might find just one little gesture or one like line is overlapping something else. You don't have to go back and render the whole shot again and put it in. 
you can just go render that one character and just render the specific frames that you need. And then you just put it all together and then it's just fine. Um, so compositing, I do all my compositing in Harmony. So that's like all of all like my special effects and stuff like that um, using these things. Uh, but for editing all of those components together at the end, um, I use DaVinci uh, because it's free <laughs> and is, uh, I think, objectively better than Premiere. Um, I'm, I'm quite fortunate now, as you can see on my taskbar here. Um, oh wait, no, my taskbar is hidden by my um, branding. Um, but I do not have any Adobe programs at all. I do not have to pay for Creative Suite anymore and I am very happy. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Uh, what, did that answer your question in regards to like managing a, a, a short film by the way like you probably had a completely different thing in mind um, so what kind of work am i doing uh at uh, princess bento i am registered as the pipeline supervisor there so i'm uh, involved with a number of their productions some a lot more than others some i'm sort of just like well i'm just sort of there for um, and there's a bit of consultancy and others I'm like really in the trenches, like on a, on a shot by shot level. It kind of just depends on what people need at the time. Um, but it's, and it's, it's pretty satisfying and it, the, the position caters pretty well to what, like what I do, <laughs> which is, you know, uh, knowing enough to be able to communicate with a lot of departments in what they do, um, uh, and help out where needed. Um, I'm not sure how much I can say beyond that, actually. Do I work remotely, though? Um, half and half. Um, some days at home, some days in the office. We got a pretty good setup. Um, okay, I think I just finished all my drawing, actually. Um, I did some, one of the eyes on one of the wrong spots. So eye back. Um, that's my front. Should be over here. Here. Now we just need to do the pupils, and then I think we're ready to finally do some rigging. Proper rigging. Um, I'm going to draw the eyes with the brush. Because I don't like having outlines on my pupils. Should probably just use the oval tool there, huh? I wanted to make, uh, Gaming Man X says, I wanted to have some voiceover talking about it, but Discord uh, file size was being stupid. Um, yeah, did you get to post your thing over there? Um, ah, no wonder I didn't um, recognize you. You got a different username <laughs> on the Discord. Um, do, you have a, do you have a preferred name that I should be using when, when addressing you here? Um, so in the Discord, uh, you're saying, uh, here's my short that I'm still working on. Uh, I'll, it'll have voice acting and whatnot. It's heavily influenced from Side Night and Happiness. It's called Mr. Super Bagman, and his only superpower is being greasy. I tried doing a little voiceover and talking about it, uh, but Discord wouldn't let me. Uh, it's almost 3 a.m. my time, and don't feel like figuring it out. That is fair enough. Uh, and I don't think I have my... Um, stream set up to play audio output at the moment anyway so you'd be out of luck with um talking about it so if, if you want to give a little bit of a spiel just typed out in chat there um that'll be that'll be good uh because you're saying that you don't mind me um showing stuff off over here because i see you've got your layering uh is that what you're asking like like could you layer this better or if, it, or if the project was just getting like a little messy um, because I'll be honest, I don't look at my layers when animating in Harmony at all. I am all about the nodes. You'll notice that I don't even have my timeline open right now. Um, because it's just purely used for navigation. And because it gets so deep and so messy, whenever I need to get to a particular layer, what you want to do is just select the part you need with the transform tool. And then you press the O key in the timeline and it just takes you to it. So it doesn't matter how messy a timeline gets, frankly, because 
as long as you can get to it in the camera view, you're good. Uh, it's much more important to have a tidy node view because um, you need to be able to visually see the connections of where something came from and where it is going. Uh, but you can't really represent that two-dimensional nature in layers, uh, so it's less important that, um, uh, that it be structured as such. Um, but otherwise, where was I? Um, yeah, so there's not really anything for me to uh, comment on here. Um, it looks fine. <laughs> it just looks like a node uh, layer, layer setup. Um, I've only been using Tombin for about four days, so I haven't got to learn much about the node system yet, um, but I'm certainly eager to learn about it. Um, that's really cool. Uh, how have you gotten um, so into it in just four days? Uh, that's, it's pretty rare to see someone embrace it uh, that wholeheartedly. Uh, has it... Uh, what, like, what have your main struggles been so far? Have there been uh, particular frustrations or snags that I might be able to uh, help out with? Um, I'm downloading the... Ah, oh, here we go. Here's the short. Ah, oh, look at it go. Fantastic. Oh, it's looking great. So it looks like you're um, using a number of techniques already. I can see from, uh, from the layers as well uh, that you got... Some deformers going for the arms. Um, hang on, I need to open this. Um, let's see if I can open this thing there. Open with VLC. Uh, that's doing like five second chunks. I suppose I could just play it real slowly. Uh, the scrubber seems to be getting at it pretty good. If I was to have any like um, quick advice to give uh, straight out of the gate, uh, you'll notice a dramatic difference if you just put a little bit of easing on the camera movements. So notice this first one is just like zip. That's pretty good. Um, but then you got this one out that comes uh, zooms out and then to the left. If that was to speed up and slow down, like I know I know it's like this is very much a work in progress. So like you're probably going to do it anyway. Um, but it helped carry the energy of it a little bit more. Um, otherwise, I think it's coming together pretty pretty good. Um, I'm pretty impressed that you got like such an understanding of um, deformers and stuff already. And it looks like there's some masking going on there as well, like the way that, um, <laughs> ironically, moves on the mask uh, around the head. That's cool. Uh, let me read the description again. Oh, oh sorry, the layer list. Uh, yeah, cool. Oh, VLC does frame by frame forwards, but not backwards. That's so lame. Uh, what's the media player that does do it? QuickTime. QuickTime does it. I should open it QuickTime. Um, honestly, I've been putting my nose to the grind uh, stone and figuring stuff out as I go. The biggest snags I've been hitting is getting overwhelmed by everything that's going on. Um, the node system I've been trying to learn for about four months, and there's always something new to learn. Um, oh, wait, that's that's Brad saying that. Sorry, you, got, you both got purple icons that threw me. Um uh, but I also understand it's um, more on what I'm attempting to take on. Um, uh, Brad saying, uh, there were tutorials from four to five years ago that I watched that turn out um, to be outdated now since I still animated in drawing nodes uh, instead of pegs. <laughs> Darn it. Yeah, that's true. Um, there's a lot of uh, legacy stuff going on. And I think it's probably time uh, in a future update of Tomb Boom to change some of the preferences because there's stuff that's on by default that isn't the standard way of doing things anymore and i think it throws newcomers off when they see that stuff front and center so they just assume that's the way that you're supposed to be working like like ik for example inverse kinematics this is a tool right next to the transform tool like this is the most used tool and this thing's legacy we haven't used this in like 10 years uh but naturally new animators are going to come to it and be like, oh, Inverse Kinematics, fantastic. And then start, you know, wanting to puppeteer all their characters that way. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, um, we've got much more powerful tools now. 
Um, but yeah, when it comes to learning the notes, like, you know, I've been using this program for, yeah, for 10 years now. Uh, and I'm still exploring all of the nodes and how they work. And that's like my jam. Like, like, um, I've read the documentation, like cover to cover on more than one occasion. Um, so yeah, it's, it's easy to get lost in the academic side of things, uh, and forget to actually, you know, make stuff. Um, so I'm very firmly of the opinion that it's best to let things grow. And unfortunately, a lot of industry animators don't get to experience that growth naturally because they come out of school and they're immediately thrown into um, an industry standard level rig. Like the super, super dense node, node network is the first thing they see after having only ever worked with TV paint or something like that. And it's very overwhelming. Um, there's, there's a lot to take in in a very short amount of time. Um, whereas I was very fortunate in my experience um, that uh, it, it naturally got to that point uh, because I was working with layers first and then it was sort of something similar to like what we're seeing here um, where it's just fancy layering um, and it slowly got more and more complicated to the point where I was making the full full standard rigs so, so I found it much easier to um, absorb than I think most people get the opportunity to, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so there's like a lot of different types of features to, to learn at first. And I think it takes a number of small projects in a particular order to really get to grips with it all, rather than trying to learn hand-drawn elements plus pegs plus deformers and everything else in one hit. I should probably put together a series that does things in that order, actually. <laughs> like, what is the order to absorb this stuff in? Um, I might give you a little bit of a primer on just the best way to um, consider nodes real quick. Um, because like, yeah, it's so easy to spend a lot of time studying them and not fully grasp um, their deal, if that makes sense. Um, but the way I really like to explain it, and I think what gives them their edge over everything else, um, is if I was to have a head, uh, a body, um, that, uh, and some hair, like that. Hair, head, body. Body. Oh, I've already got a body in this scene, don't I? Um, body, head one, uh, hair one. So at the moment, we've just got a standard layer system. Like this is not doing anything different that you can't just get with regular layers. Only that, you know, furthest most left is on top. Hair, I want to be on the bottom. So it gets stacked down there, etc. cetera. Um, but where things get interesting is how uh, pegs allow a hierarchy that is independent of layer order. So if the head and the hair peg were to, sh uh, layers were to share a peg and the body was left out, then you get this. I think most people who are new to nodes are not quite understanding it. This is the example where things start to click. By separating layer order from hierarchy, you are able to have things naturally exist in front and behind another layer simultaneously. And everything else to do with nodes, it's built upon that one principle. And everything becomes a lot more easy to absorb. This is the core mechanic of nodes in Harmony. Experiment with being able to do this, because then if I were to have one more peg on top of that, that brought the body along, great. Now I've got a master that moves everything. Super easy. Um, and then you just add more parts uh, and then things get more and more complicated. And then you end up with like something super insane that covers the whole screen. Um, and then all of like the filters, all of the deformers, like like this, like, you know, as, as many as there are Pokemon amount of contraptions and things, um, I would consider to simply be expansions. Um, like I, I would probably, like personally, I would probably vouch for 
um, Harmony advanced the middle tier version of the program to have the node view, but for it to basically just be these components, just to introduce people to the system and be able to navigate it around and take advantage of layering things in that way um, before they get overwhelmed by the infinity amount of ways to combine everything else involved. Um, I hope that helps. Um, anyway, uh, where were we? Um, uh, Drek says, the shake node is good for handheld camera look. Ah, but did you see the video I made about the motion capture tween where you can naturally make a handheld camera uh, movement using your actual hand movement? That was the best. Um, Brad says the tutorials from two to four to five years ago. Um, oh yeah, I already read that now. Um, Isaac says, it's getting late for me. You all have a good night. Take care, Isaac. Thank you so much for coming by. Um, Gary Maniac goes on to say, thanks for the advice. Uh, the camera move was uh, definitely standing out to me, but um, I keep getting sidetracked on random details. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I had a feeling that it was just something you hadn't gotten around to yet. Something that might make navigating your scene a little bit easier, by the way. Um, consider being able to deactivate pegs on the fly. Uh, so if you were to turn off the peg that's attached to your camera, like if you just hide it like here, um, then you can sort of just see the scene being still again and just focus on character movement and whatever, and then do the, um, the cameras later. Um, I lean on that sort of thing all the time just to be able to isolate what you do and do not need to be focusing on in the given moment. Um, uh, hello, what's up? Am I making a game? No, I'm not making a game. I am rigging a character for a uh, pilot animation. Uh, this is what they look like so far. Um, I've been drawing each individual component uh, and I'm about to string them all together so that an animator can start bringing them to life. Ooh. Um, should be good fun. Um, now, uh, Gary Manic says, uh, that makes a lot of sense. I was actually struggling for a little while on how to organize objects that are both in front and behind a specific layer. Indeed. Uh, when it comes to relayering things on the fly, like if a character has their arms behind and then they move to in front, that's where animating in three dimensional space comes in, but that's like a whole, whole separate thing. <laughs> um, Jack says, how good are backdrops? I love backdrops. Uh, being able to have groups that are not really groups, these things here, so you can still see the guts. Um, yeah, <laughs> not much else to say about them, I suppose. Um, I remember when they first got introduced, it was a big deal. Um, uh, Josie says, uh, yes, wait, oh wait, no, uh, Josie had a question further up, sorry. Um, Random question, have you created any characters with pegs for implementation in games like Unity? If yes, any hard lessons learned? Um, and then you're saying that uh, you're a small indie team that were deciding this month whether to make it with Blender, Toon Boom, 3D, and it looks like you're gonna go with Toon Boom. Fantastic. Um, I personally haven't done it, um, but I know that it is very possible. There are... Um, tools involved for it. Uh, so for example, when, let's give it a quick go actually. Um, I need to explore it with Unity in p particular, but it is made to work directly with Unity. I'll say that, so it should be um, just fine. Um, so for example, one of the bone types um, is game bone. <laughs> uh, so it's a regular deformer type uh, for uh, bending and manipulating things around uh, that has some of the metadata removed to make it more Unity compatible. Um, and then the type that you export it as, so most game projects I've been around have been more sprite based, if that makes sense. Like they export things as image sequences um, rather than being able to get the pegs in there and use them as like physics or whatever the heck you do over there. Um, so let me read the question again. Have you, with uh, pegs for implementation in a game like Unity. Um, let's check out the export settings. Hey, uh, because what would you export it as even? Like, do you know, like if, Josie, if you've been um, messing around with that kind of thing, what did you use? Uh, how did you get it out? 
because the only options I see here is images, movie, etc. Um, or is there an export down here? That does it. Right. No, that's all drawing and movie again. But I think there might have been some game based tools down here. Nope, just the game bone. But I know that one of these toolbars is to do with it, but I'm pretty sure it's just. Ah, what's this? Toggle anchor, toggle prop, export to sprite sheets, export to easel JavaScript. What's that? Ah. Existing clips in folder, unconnected display. Sprite resolution. They're still talking about sprite sheets though. Exporting as images rather than um, being able to keep its skeletal structure intact. Um, we had a meeting with Toon Boom. Uh, it would come in as a sprite sheet with each peg being spread out. Oh, okay. So that means the, the drawings were, but are you saying that like you were able to keep components separate, like the arms could be separate from the body and they, but they would still be attached in the right spot. Um, Drex has another question. Uh, have you had any experience with the grease pencil in Blender? I have not. I do have Blender. Um, but I don't really know my way. I, I mean, I used to know Blender pretty well. I was really, really into it in 2009, <laughs> 2009, 2010. So it was a really long time ago. Uh, and the program has been completely reinvented, uh, a few times since then. Um, so 2d animation, um, I'm really looking forward to experimenting with it a little bit more. Um, but what I'm really curious about is how well does Blender's Grease Pencil integrate with the other features of Blender? Can I get it going with, say, like the, what are they called? The material nodes? Is that what they're called? Um, like there's a, there's a node based system in here where you can like build architecture. Like it's nuts. Um, it would be really interesting if you can build that together because then hypothetically you would be able to have a frame by frame animation where everything looks like a photorealistic felt and that's your brush right that, that's that's where my imagination goes when it comes to thinking about this sort of thing but i don't know if it if it, if it means something like that um anyway uh back to the task at hand <laughs> get to see how far i can get into this before um i've got about oh no i've still got like two hours left that's that's ages um, where were we? I think we've just finished all the drawing. Uh, or have we? Where is my drawing? D turn. I don't want D turn. I want just regular display. Um, cause we've got the first pupil in. Um, I will rotate that on a vector level. Controversial, but whatever. Uh, and have that exist over here as well. Looks like this pupil is a little bit smaller. I'm not sure if they actually want it to be. I better keep it the same size just for safety. Uh, and then at long last, we will be ready to move into something a little bit more uh, riggy. Actually, no, no, I need to do the fill pass, don't I? Fill pass and sub layer splitting. Ugh. So uh, let's turn off the reference and start no we need to go to only the reference and start building out our palette i probably should have done this at the very beginning but whatever um so uh regular layer t for thumbnail brings up an opacity slider here um, bring that up to 100 percent uh go back to a regular layer and let's get the palette going so this blue here i've been using already as my line uh and this <laughs> one that's called blue but it's actually green i've been using as my um, mat, oh, not as my mat, but as my, um, uh, s invisible strokes to mark out the, the round edges, whereas these colors don't exist. So I'm going to get rid of those. Ugh, don't know why that's being controversial. Okay. Uh, let's get out a whole bunch of new ones and start. I like to name them first. I'll say skin uh, eye white uh, eyelid. 
is a tint uh, shirt collar tie um, tongue uh, shoes red shoes white and that's it uh, so you'll notice that there's some things that are similar colors like the tongue the tie the shoes uh, but I've given them all separate swatches uh, same for the eye whites the collar and the shoes as well um, are independent uh, and this is one of the things that I really like about Harmony's um, color system is that multiple things can be the exact same tint and yet be registered as separate data and I can give it different behavior uh, so now that everything's named, I can just sort of switch my brain off and just systematically go through each one of these um, and fill in all my swatches. Um, eyelid, shirt, collar. Um, oh, more comments coming in. The second green is my rotation point. Oh, it was two. It was two. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's what I get for not paying attention. Good thing I didn't delete it. Um, Joey Loomis says, is there any way to update your reference image so that you are drawing over and reload it? Sort of like a reload or relink footage in other applications. Um, yes, I think there is, but it's a little bit of a workaround, if that makes sense. Like it's not really a, um, like a recommended way to go, if that makes sense. Um, but I'll, I'll show you how it works. It, it's got to do with the, like the way the back end of the program works. Um, so rangeupmoment.com, have a scroll through here and see if there's any features that, uh, spark your attention. Some of them are great. Some of them are just little like quality of life things. Like if you accidentally use the curve instead of the envelope all the time, like it just gets rid of that little nub that sticks out of the end. That's great. Um, this thing makes the master controllers actually like really usable as opposed to like a nice gimmick. Uh, I mean, master controllers are nice already, but this makes it like, really good. Uh, delete unexposed drawings. That's pretty handy. Like there's lots of really just useful, uh, neat bits in here. Uh, and you can see that my Harmony interface is just filled with a bunch of them. Uh, a lot of them I haven't quite messed around with yet. So that's where they live. And then when I've sort of like gotten used to them and integrated them to my workflow, they get promoted from being a custom script that I imported to having a proper place on my timeline. So you can see that one there. These two custom scripts is something that I hope our community sees an influx on in time with more people learning how to do it, creating custom features and sharing them all around. Um, I keep losing my spot. Okay. I think that's all of the colors done. Uh, so time to turn the reference off. go to filling everything in. So line art will become black. Um, oops, <laughs> that destroyed the pupils. They will become white. Oops. Now I'll systematically go through everything again, making everything the colors they should be. I keep a secondary camera up here for this purpose so I can just get a visual reference of what's going on without it clogging up my space all right tail um, leg back oh you need oops <laughs> this boy why shouldn't have turned my strokes off yet Get that connected. Uh, and delete this. Um, hmm. I should probably do some sub layering at the same time. I could churn through and do everything at once, but yeah, now let's do it properly. Here I am over in drawing view. Uh, and I'm going to do a whole bunch of sub layer splitting at the same time. Unfortunately, my shortcuts are dead. I wish they weren't. So I could flip back and forth between the line art and the color art sub layers on the fly. 
Um, try and get them working again. Uh, line art, create line art from color art, uh, switch to line art color art, shift L. Yeah, that's fine. I thought it was that. I've got like a macro key set up that does it. Um, let's see if it's happening. Shift L. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's doing it, but my uh, custom one's not doing it. Can't remember what I set the macro key to do. Oh well. Um, so, cut those down to the color out sub layer, paste back again, and then the green piece, delete. Easy. Uh, on to the next one. So, first things first. Uh, that pivot information, I'm going to cut that and put it onto the overlay. Uh, and then down here, what do we have? Uh, skin, shirt, and then shoe stuff. Sh oh, geez. <laughs> I don't need closed gaps on, do I? Don't close gap unless it's just not connected. Yeah, it's not. Oh my goodness, look at that. Um, am I gonna be rude? Yeah, I'm gonna be rude. Dang. Um, shoe red goes there, and then shoe's white. Boop, boop. Did you not feel either? How careless have I been? There we go. Drex goes on to say, thanks, I'm part of the Tim Boom Discord, uh, and they talk about scripts nonstop, but I don't have any experience with them yet. Yeah, I really need to learn more too. Um, maybe that should be more of a community thing. Like I'll start, like what if I were to start broadcasting my progress and my studies, and then we can all learn at the same pace. That could be fun. Um, if I write, rebind them, they should work. Yeah, but um, it's set up using my, I've, I've got like some macro keys on my keyboard. And it looks like that's become unhooked. So like, let's, it's so like, I've got it, this key here. So line art and color art, but what is that set to right now? Um, edit, right shift plus. Golly, I guess I um, made it something really weird. Um, shift L it's claiming to be now. Right shift L, bang. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> um, okay, so select by color, white, red, gray, skin, cut, switch, paste, switch back, uh, select the greens, delete. And then that is how you parkour. Um, oop, select by color off. Uh, so grab that, go up to overlay, paste, back to line art, uh, and then we go uh, skin, shirt color, uh, shoes, bang, 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 um, uh-oh, um, this shoe red, that gets complicated, ding, 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 uh, and then shoes white, ding, Ding, and then select by color, bang, 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 cut, flip, paste, flip, delete green, done. I really like this part of the process. It's, it's so therapeutic. Uh, oh, where's my reference? Is it dark on the bottom? All oh, right, we're looking at the body now. So that is the actual shirt color up here. That and that. See how fast she could do it with the macros on? Oh, she was beautiful. <laughs> um, thanks for inspiring me to rig you spaceship pilot. Oh, uh, you're welcome. I hope uh, it's, ugh. <laughs> oh no, what have I done? Oh, that's the worst. Will that even connect if I try and fuse it? Oh, oh no, oh no. That's not good at all. I'm gonna have to abort the um, shades that I already had. 
um, stash that up here for now and fuse that together. It's, it, the fusion is okay. It's okay. Uh, let's, let's give it a little bit of beef. There we go. No, that's not too lumpy. All good. All right. Let's, uh, get you back to the, oops, back to the line art. And then, uh -oh. oh no, now that's too short. Pull a vertice right out. There we go. Skin, shirt. Grab both. Cut, 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 cut. Get out of here. There we go. All right. Something a bit easier. Collar, tie. Arm's an interesting one because it's got a gap in it. Now I could complete the shape, but I don't want to. I'm going to leave it complete because I'm leaning on the fact that this animator is probably going to be working with um, a traditional arm on top of this. Um, so I have a decision to make at this point. Will I draw the shoulder around here and try and mask it away from that collar? which one runs me the risk of if the animator ever moves this hand up above the collar, the hand and the rest of the arm is going to mask into that space as well, which I probably don't want. However, on the contrary, if I was to make the shape of the arm that that shape there, um, although the lower arm and everything will go on top of the collar, now this would go on top as well. But frankly, I think that's the lesser of two evils. Uh, so yeah, screw it, I'm just gonna do that. Um, so that can just live uh, like like this. Back to the uh, drawing view. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Um, great. Arm B even easier. Uh, ding 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 ding. Leave the shirt. Joe says, I'm jumping ahead here, but it looks like you are building a rig using forward kinematics as opposed to deformers. Uh, in forward kinematics, um, you can use the dynamic spring. Uh, is it possible with deformers? I am actually building a hybrid rig uh, based on the boards that this character needs to perform. Um, they're, they only appear for about three or four shots and their gestures are quite involved. So I could comfortably spend like the next day and a half um, building the arms to be capable of doing um, this sort of movement. But frankly, it would be way quicker if, if it was just drawn traditionally. So that's what I'm doing. Um, the body and things like that are gonna have envelope deformers. Uh, most of the face is gonna be rigged traditionally, um, but on the most part, the arms and the legs are basically just placeholder pieces. Uh, and then the animator will likely be drawing uh, traditional and the arms and legs that are attached to the pre-built body. Uh, so they'll likely find um, a bit of convenience in being able to duplicate drawings and twist and bend the shapes around. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think they're going to find too much uh, use uh, for deformers uh, in this case. I hope that makes sense. Um, is there a way to cheat the overshoot um, like the dynamic spring does? Yes. Uh, I'm going to do a quick demo of that because I think it's a fun little feature um, or a fun little uh, workflow. Uh, it's about exploiting uh, eases. So if I get a circle um, and have that uh, animate across the screen from uh, left to right like this. There you go, and there, start there. Control K to connect. All right, super, super robotic movement, right? Um, wait, that's just playing one frame at a time. It's not playing the whole thing. There it goes, pretty gross. Um, and then, uh, as we all know, we can apply a regular ease to it, and it will go, um, you know, 
speed up and slow down as as one does and we get the S curve like that. But if I was to instead bend it down like this below 0% and above 100%, what's gonna happen then? <laughs> it's pretty dramatic. <laughs> Whoa. Um, I made it really intense. That was way too intense. Um, let's make it something more like, something more shallow, but more drawn out. There we go. So it ducks below its destination and then goes back out again. Is that getting at what you're talking about? Um, it's funny that some animators prefer thinking this way than uh, doing it by eye. But if you're still getting used to the principles, I think this can be uh, a good way to um, sort of get off the ground. Um, because then if I go to this point and I plant a keyframe on that spot um, and I go to the other most extreme, plant a keyframe on that spot, um, it doesn't really met it doesn't mess it up, you know, like it didn't compound another spring after that point, it preserved it. So this animation still looks exactly the same as it did before, uh, only now um, as keyframed and I can, st and I can, you know, finesse it and ease it a little bit more and I really get it how, how I want it to be working, which is really nice. Um, and when people take advantage of this, I, I always recommend that, like go back and put those keyframes in uh, because it can be a little bit confusing to look at when you've got something radically changing direction like that. Cause, cause you know, like uh, fundamentally, like, like anim from an animation theory perspective, this is your keyframe, right? Because it's stopping, it's changing direction and it's performing a new movement. And yet on the timeline, that keyframe is not marked. It, it's almost invisible. Um, so it's good to uh, go back and, and mark it, but it, it can be nice for s sort of saving some time because you can, um, you can have like a whole like A to B movement for like a character's pose. And then by pulling that lever down, you can sort of generate your own overshoot uh, and then just sort of tweak it from there rather than having to pose all 100 pieces of that character. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it's a nice, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's a bit of a luxury, you know, it can get you like 80% of the way there. Um, I wouldn't really lean on it as a as a way to animate from beginning to end, uh, but it's definitely something that you can exploit. Um, Brad asks, is there any plans on making a video about hybrid rig traditional style? Yeah, you're watching it. <laughs> this is why I wanted to um, broadcast uh, the building of this character because it is all about um, uh, the discussion of uh, the benefits of hybrid rigging, taking advantage of both mediums where possible. Uh, we'll see if I get around to editing it down. Um, and I would like to do some videos about the animate, animation process of it. A lot of my more experimental videos um, go into this topic quite a bit because the animations that I make for fun in like an hour or so are almost always some level of, of hybrid, right? Um, because it's something that I'm finding out like an hour. So if we would have a quick glance at them, um, let's see here. Um, this, oh, where is it? This one here, laser focus. That's probably like one of my favorite ones in that way. Cause it's like an improvised thing where it's just like I did a drawing, some of it, like, like the wheels were traditional, but like the eye on top sort of like bobs around on a peg and there's like a little bit of deformer in there, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so like I love doing traditional stuff and then you sort of like emphasize it with a little bit of peg movement or you have something that's rigged and you emphasize it with a little bit of hand-drawn movement, stuff like that. It's like you're leaning in one direction or the other on the hybrid, uh, on the um, spectrum. Uh, and then, uh, taking a dash from another, um, which is why someone was talking before about um, the argument between a full flash, uh, like full rigged workflow and a full traditional workflow. And I think both extremes are rare. You're almost always somewhere along the spectrum, but you're just favoring one side over the other. Um, 
Joey says, uh, I tend to pull action templates uh, from the library for my poses for deformer rigs and was trying to cheat over shoots. Thanks again. Oh, fantastic. So do you think by combining action templates with uh, the, that easing that you'll be able to pull that off? Uh, that's also great to hear that you've got functional um, action templates. They're surprisingly rare because rigs are getting updated all the time and then old templates basically become obsolete. Uh, where was I? I'd done body, done the collar. Have we done this arm yet? Yes. Have we done this arm yet? Yes. Oh yeah, the hair was next. The hair was next. Um, I think I might switch over to doing this one in drawing view. Uh, with the strike tool. Did I get an independent color out for the hair? I don't think I did. It definitely needs to be its own color. Um, interior of the ear should probably be its own color as well, even if it's shared by the um uh, by the clothes. Uh, let's get a couple more then. Let's double check that it is indeed pure black. Yes. And the interior ear is super dark gray. Hair. Yeah, inner. Great. All right. Light table on. Stroke on. There we go. Fill. Head to. Zoop. Oop. Connect. Fill. Head to. I love the stroke tool. Uh, so notice that throughout this entire drawing process, by the way, of the last couple of hours, hopefully the um the quality of the stream shows it. I don't know about you, but like my thumbnail is like at 240p. <laughs> 144? Oh my goodness. Um, hopefully it's a bit crisper than that on your end. Um, but I've had this show strokes mode on like the whole time, like the whole time where you see this really thin blue outline. That's super important. And I think it's um, very commonly overlooked. Uh, skin... Uh... Golly, I really shouldn't call it shirt, hey? It's just, uh, I don't know, body secondary. And that is body main. Let's do that. Or well, body one, body two, I don't know. Whatever. I don't need to, <laughs> there's not too much um, strict naming conventions on this project, I think. I seem to be getting away with it. Uh, body main, uh, what was next? Uh, secondary and ear inner. I think, are they slightly different tints? I, maybe, anyway. They might change later and now we have the freedom to do so. Head, all right, you're an interesting one because look at how that changes underneath the collar. The body becomes uh, skin colored again. And there's a very fine line here on when that happens. I have a feeling I'm going to need to separate that and mask it after the fact, uh, which is probably gonna be like the riggiest thing this rig does. Uh, that might think, make things a little odd uh, for the animator, but hopefully it won't be um, too wackadoo. Uh, I'm gonna use the eye whites for the nose and the hair color for the main nose probably should make it a separate thing, but whatever. Um, meanwhile, mouth interior, that definitely needs to be its own color. You never know when someone's going to change it from being a black to like a dark red or something. Always need that flexibility. Same deal with the tongue. Eye back, eye white. Uh, eyelid pupil and brow is oh brow needs a stroke as well connecting those pieces oops there we go uh, and this eye eye white eyelid oh whoops mouth has a hole in it that's sloppy very sloppy now notice I'm not going to patch it. I'm not going to do another one in there. I'm going to delete this one, uh, fill in the gap and then fill it. Um, but I can preserve my stroke by 
adding a vertice and stretching that up, making sure that the intersection is true and complete. Um, when you're actually in the animation phase, uh, it's not quite as important to be quite uh, as precious. But on the base rig model, you know, this is something that people are interacting with a lot. You know, I don't, I don't want to be rude by giving them messy artwork. Uh, give you a taper. Okie dokie. All right. The drawing is complete. How beautiful. <laughs> Uh, okay, time to fix up the layering, uh, the masking. Like now, it's we are finally time to start moving into uh, what we would call the rigging process, and not just the rigging process. Once I get rid of the dang ear outlines. Oh wait, hang on. I've, I haven't done my um, sub layer splitting for half of it. I stopped that after the uh, arms. But I really should be consistent. I don't really need to do it on things like the hair, but um, I should, hang on. I'm going to be lazy on these ones that didn't quite connect. That one did, that one did. All right, good. Um, yeah, I want to be consistent here and send all of these down. Ding, 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 ding. And ding, 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 ding. All right, great. Um, for the ear. Ugh. There's a spare stroke down there. Get out of here. Those down there. Get rid of that. One, two, three. Cut down. Get rid of the green. Get rid of the stroke. Uh, all right. Head. You're an easy one. Nose. I'd probably get away with keeping that one preserved, but all good. Mouth, send that down. I very important to send this one down. In fact, only the eye white will be sent. Eye lid stays up there. Very important. We'll find out why soon. Move that down. Same with the eye white there. And that's all of them. Great. Okay, now we can look at our really ugly character and start rearranging the parts properly. Um, all right. It's getting pretty late at night for a lot of people, I think. Um, 1 a.m. I'm actually surprised that there's as many people here as there are because like, looking at my clock, it's 1 a.m. in the U.S., um, like east side. No, west side. 4 a.m. east side and only like 9 a.m. Uh, in like Europe. So... <laughs> That means most of the world is pretty late right now. <laughs> uh, so from uh, Love from India, uh, hello, welcome. So what time is it there right now? It must be like, what, like 6 a.m., 5 a.m. or something? Um, and Gaming Maniac says, I uh, forgot to add, I'm looking forward to the next stream. Hopefully I'll have an update on my animation by then. Fantastic, I'll be happy to show it off again. Uh, I might take this opportunity to have a quick uh, five minute break. Um, just, oh, 1 p.m. Okay, yes, that's right. You guys are a few hours ahead, um, not behind. No, wait, yeah, behind, 1 p.m. Because it's 5 p.m. here. So you, that's right, yeah, you are during the day rather than during the night. Um, cool. Um, all right, I'm going to uh, just go to the bathroom and fill up my water and stuff like that after speaking for hours and end. Um, so uh, go have a break. Hopefully I'll see you all back here in uh, five minutes. Uh, and we'll relayer this thing, get it all rigged up, get the pivots in there, get the auto patching in there, uh, and try and get this thing uh, more or less finished um, in the next... Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, about an hour and a bit. Um, so yeah, the bulk of the work for this one will hopefully have just been the drawing process. We'll see. Um, all right, so uh, back in a moment. Take care. Oh, back again. That was quick. That was less than five minutes. However, people are about to start microwaving again. So I may have no choice but to disappear for another few minutes. Uh, please do uh, bear with me. 
I'm about to start building some stuff. So back to it. Oh, hang on. Oops. <laughs> I'm still learning out the buttons of my um, streaming stuff. Uh, get out of here. All right. So first things first, should we be spending time on our masking or spending time on our hierarchy? I think I might do a little bit of basic masking first just to get things in the right, um, just so I know what the heck I'm looking at still. Uh, things are pretty subjective from this point. If you want to be doing, um, like a lot of people will do their hierarchy first. Like it's probably a bit weird to some of the riggers amongst you to not see any green up here yet, like at all. Um, but again, being a, being a hybrid rig, uh, I think it's okay. Like there's not going to be like too much complexity that I'm really too worried about and making any detrimental mistakes up there. Um, whereas what I really do want to do is start to be able to see what the heck I'm looking at here. Uh, so I need to start splitting my uh, layers around and getting things into the right spot. So first things first, I need my legs to be on top, I think. Um, what do they need to be underneath? Because how high up do they go? They go pretty high up, you see. Um, and I probably even need to separate uh, the wiggly bit from the other bit. Okay, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's do the obvious ones first. The back arm should be behind, but that doesn't get laid there. That gets moved there. So yeah, no. Let's let's do our let's do our hierarchy first. So Control Shift P, everything gets its peg. Um, and then we systematically work our way through each one, putting the pivot in the right spot with the rotation tool. Uh, and I like to do this with a display so everything can get out of the way and I can focus on exactly where everything needs to go. Uh, so you go here, um, back leg, and our, this one had a pivot guide for us. So you go right there. Uh, this one also has a pivot guide. In you go. Um, body. I might be able to go back to regular from here. Um, now, this one, let's experiment a bit. Would it be better to swing from here or from maybe around there? I reckon there. Um, collar. Um, I will need the display there. Hang on. Can I get... Good to have a... Let's get a transparency going. It's getting annoying. There we go. Collar, I'll swing from there. Arm left. Don't need to be too precious about it, but I think there will be fine. There will be fine. Hair is a bit more important. Um, I'm just gonna get all this stuff up in the general vicinity first. So then I can sort of zoom in and be more precise with it in a moment. Up you go. Ding, 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 ding. Golly, there's a lot of them. There's a lot. I remember this. There's not many layers in this rig. Um, but notice that I'm sort of like dividing it up into like just a step. I'm just doing all of them in one go. Um, so they're up in the uh, like a general vicinity. Um, I think I'll do some hierarchy based ones now. Um, I want to have a masked in layer to uh, make that neck the right color. Uh, so I'm gonna create that now. Just call it neck. You'll exist here. Uh, I won't draw it yet, but it'll also have a peg uh, that will be around here. Um, now let's see. Fate. Uh, now, like, what level of parenting do I want with this kind of thing? Um, we want uh, the pupil to be connected by the eye. Um, but there's a decision to be made here because if I, uh, I probably should go through to the first tier of pivots first. Sorry, I'm back, I do this all the time and yet I'm still second guessing everything every single time. Hey, bizarre. Um, 
a uh, few more questions coming in. Uh, so can I animate rainfall uh, like anime and can I just animate like anime in general? Uh, I can. Uh, it's not something I'm very experienced in, so I'm not great at it. Uh, the tool set of how to do it here is uh, dramatically different to what I'm showing off today. Uh, so it might be something that I put on the back burner for <laughs> another time. Uh, really trying to get this project done as soon as possible. Um, so now I've sort of thrown these points up in a somewhere close to where I want them to be. I'm going to uh, go back through them again in the other order and sort of get them into the right spot. So eyes, I find their pivot tends to play a lot better when they're towards the bottom of the eye rather than in the middle. Uh, so if you see here, so like that, or, you know, maybe even that, like where's likely to actually see a little bit of action. Uh, the thing that's probably more likely to be animated than anything else would be the scale. So like that sort of movement, uh, much more so than that sort of movement, you know. Uh, mouth, I reckon. This has got to go right there, surely. Nose there. The head itself, where's that going to go? I think I probably got that right first time, but if it was to go up here at the top of the head, uh, nah. So don't forget to always test. You never know. Because, uh, like, there is... Uh, I guess that's okay. What about here? Where would that swing from? A few places. I reckon, I reckon it's there. That makes sense. You need to, like, grab that body and make that envelope still connect, but that's okay. Um, neck is fine. And I think... Uh, what, yeah. There? Or maybe here. Maybe there on that corner. Yeah, I reckon up there. See, like, you wouldn't think to put it there unless you, like, gave it a swing first, right? So, always give it a go. Um, hmm. Should it be that end then? Yeah, I reckon probably down there. That spike down there is probably going to give me some trouble, though. I might need to change the artwork on that so it doesn't go so deep. Because, like, it immediately sticks out. That's pretty rough. Um, I might update that right now, actually, before I get too deep into the swing of things. That's my backup node view. Hang on. Back ear. I'm going to go a line here. And I need... How does that look on the camera view? A little bit too... That'll do. So you become black. Trying to fall this rubbish. Yeah. And I'm going to take that line to save me a little bit of time. Um, copy that down to the color art. And then just use that pre-existing line to trim off that. And then I'm, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Joe says, is there a best way to know when I'll be doing future live streams? Unfortunately not. Um, I tend to be pretty sporadic about it. <laughs> um, Twitter's probably the best place. Um, I'll try to let you know on Discord as well. Um, but yeah, follow my Twitter is probably the best thing to do. I'll, I'll try and give like an hour heads up before the next one. Uh, I really want to make a routine out of it, which would be, uh, so like, I don't really know how to calculate the time zones from here, but it's it's 6 p.m. on s Monday right now. Uh, and ideally, I would really like to do them at approximately 9 a.m. every Saturday, my time. Yeah, um, so I guess figure that out for yourselves, whatever the heck that means. Um, all right, that is fi fixed up. Uh, now's, now's the fun part at last. Um, I'm going to do some more hierarchy things. So for this eye, which is going to contain the pupil, I've got this eye and this pupil, and I want the eye to carry the pupil with it. Um, so I could hook it up like this. That'll carry the pupil with it. Uh, but I don't always want that. Sometimes I still want to get to the eye by itself. So you want to have something like this, where there's another peg on top that connects to the pupil, and then you have the best of both worlds. I have the one that's parenting it, 
and I can still get to that underneath part if I need to. However, by creating that new peg, it pivots all the way back down here in the middle of the body, which sucks. So instead, if I duplicate this original peg, oh no, my duplicate shortcut's gone. Duplicate selected nodes. That will create one and that will preserve the pivot from before. And I'll call that like, um, usually we call that like I front master or something. Uh, but I don't like overusing the word master. I think that's annoying. Uh, so I'll probably rename that to like I white. So then that can simply be called I. Um, bear with me as I turn my duplicate shortcut button back on because that I cannot live without that one. Um, duplicate node, is that in there? Or is it just duplicate? Let's see if that works. Hey, there it goes. Much nicer. Okay, so, um, so same thing here. Duplicate that I, hook it in, uh, and you'll be called uh, I white, and you'll just be called I. Good naming is important. So 1 a.m. here, uh, in Hollywood. Uh, how about that? Um, yeah, so I respect that I am streaming at probably not the most opportune time of day at all, as there are currently only six of you watching. <laughs> uh, which is a real shame, because it is by far the best time for me to be streaming, and I would probably stream a lot more often if this was um, a decent time to do, but... Oh well. Um, okay. Where were we? Um, eyes are there... Uh, mouth, nose, and head. Now, I don't think it's super important to have just the nose and mouth combined, uh, but the very next piece would likely just be the face. Uh, so I'm going to get all of these here, peg them together into one, uh, and call that face peg, and its pivot will be slap bang in the middle of the eyes. So now we can move the whole face around like so. Uh, and there's also the question of if the ears should be a part of that. And I vouch for no, because this ear is likely to move at a different pace to the rest of the face, and that ear is going to move in the opposite direction of the face. So I'm going to keep that separate. Instead, I'm going to duplicate this head peg here. This one will be called Headmaster. Huh. Um, I guess I can get rid of the dash P in that case. Uh, and that's going to be connected to the head, the face, uh, the ears, probably not the neck, um, because this is going to do all sorts of interesting things. Because like, is that like, see how that sort of like turns like that, moves around? If the neck was connected to that, it would start to form all sorts of weird clipping issues. So I think that's probably still best to carry it with the body. Um, but I will have the hair. Um, I want one just for all of the hair by themselves. Uh, and then that follows along with Headmaster. Uh, so I want to try and level out the secondary tier ones like that. So it's all in a row. Try and keep things as level as possible for the sake of easily selecting stuff. Like I can just box select along like that and just grab all of those those little pieces. Very, very handy. Um, all right, Kavi, have a good night. Thanks for uh, spending so much time hanging out here. Um, all right, uh, next is the body. String those up. Once again, that'll get a duplicate. We'll call that um, uh, upper body. So duplicating again is just so that I can keep the peg that I used last time. Uh, and that's going to incorporate, uh, let's see, both arms, the collar and the body, but nothing from the lower body. So I can press Control P to 
just generate, like connect them all in one go. And this is a bit of a dud peg though. I don't want to use that because it's got a bad pivot. But if I hook it up to this one and then delete it, then hey, I get to preserve all those connections, which is pretty handy. Uh, so upper body is going to bring the collar and arm and everything else, but it's also going to bring the head. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have one more that brings the lower body as well. That's going to be a fresh peg that also brings these, hooks all of that together, and that's going to be called, um, uh, I, get, I think just like uh, body uh, master. Uh, and usually there's one more on top of that just for the purpose of staging. So ferret guy. Both of these will have their pivots at the very, very base, like so. All right, so that's the basic hierarchy done. Time to get the layering better because it is real gross and has been real gross for a while. Um, but now that we've got some layering going on, uh, we can decide what things should be shifted in Z-Space and what things should be masked into place, okay? Um, so I'm gonna get uh, two camera views up, one of my main character and one of my uh, reference. So I can see them side by side uh, and try and get them to match. Pretty straightforward, um, but possibly easier said than done. Uh, so uh, let's see front leg. I want to try and keep its grouping together in the composite in that spot. Uh, so I'm going to press control down with the transform to shift that forward one level in Z space. Uh, likewise with this back arm, which is all um, laid in front. Um, I'm going to layer it behind the front arm, but both of them are laid in front of the body. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to shift that back one in Z space. There we go. It's starting to come together already. Um, the ears um, now the front ear is always going to be in front of the head uh, in that regard. So I think I'm cool with that ear coming in front of the other on a layering level, maybe. Um, hmm. Yeah. There we go. Um, well, we had a bit of a problem with the eyes before with this brow not being uh, fully behind. So that should be here. Yeah, there we go. See that? So that line was behind that. Now it's in front. Um, so that's gotten us part of the way there. Uh, now we need to start using our sub layers more cleverly as well. Um, so most parts have both a line art and a color art um, because we went through and we separated them all. Um, yeah, I am gonna auto patch the legs. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, now, most of the time I will get out all of the sub layer isolators for every single piece. All of them will have their line art and color art. If it was a more complicated rig, they would all have their overlay, underlay and auto patches as well in the standard setup. Uh, I don't want to overkill it here. I'm only going to pull out what's necessary. Um, so let's do the obvious ones first. Um, like say the eye whites here. So that is a uh, color art uh, and cutter where the pupil is only visible inside the color art of eye. There we go. Easy. Uh, now, bit of a uh, controversial thing here because notice that this eye is layered on top of, like you can see how it's like a bluish tint. So if this pupil were a different color than the um, outlines, we would see it partially on top of the outlines. So for the sake of uh, safety, uh, you always want to get another level of line art and put that on top on top. So now that pupil there, you can see it's not on top anymore. It's going to appear truly behind. Um, so let me just tidy that up a little bit uh, into what we would expect to see. Um, something like that. That's good. Uh, that's going to have the same setup for the other eye. Um, so, line out, color out. There we 
we go. So I can move around freely in there now. Um, now, most of the face, except for the brow, because notice this eye and the mouth and the nose as well, they're all going to appear only exclusively inside the head. Uh, but the brow doesn't. So I'm going to unhook that for the time being. We'll deal with it in a second. This is probably like my favorite part of the rigging process, by the way, because it feels like a puzzle. Just trying to connect everything in the most efficient way that um, still works. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Face. We're going to have to get uh, more color at line up for that. Uh, where is head? There we go. Um, so you go through there. Um, most of the face, not including the ears. Um, so I'll leave you off for now, leave the neck off for now. But nose, yes, mouth, yes, both eyes, yes. So all of this um, is going to go through that. Uh, so we're going to get a cutter out at this point um, and feed that to be visible through this cutter in the same way that the eyes did. Um, yeah, there we go, that worked. Um, second verse, same as the first, line art on top of everything. Um, and the color art can also exist raw just underneath. Um, now on this one, I could have put the color art just behind it, but I did uh, the full thing because we've got um, the eyelids existing on the on the line out there. So uh, for safety's sake, all of that uh, uh, can coexist. Uh, so the animator has less things that they need to like memorize and be actively on top of. Uh, meanwhile, the brow here, I'm gonna have sitting on top of everything like that. Um, I might change its parenting, uh, move that sort of down the queue a little bit. Uh, so that it sort of lives alongside the ears. Now notice it's still parented by the face, uh, but that just seems like a more natural spot for its uh, string to, to flow. Let's give ourselves some more real estate here. Never be shy about having things be as vertical as you need them to be. Um, and then we've got that ear on top, this ear behind, and then the hair assembly, um, oh, in between that ear. There we go. Uh, and that looks like all that needs. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. There was nothing uh, too outrageous happening there. We didn't need any auto patches or anything like that. Um, we still need to do the neck assembly, um, which I think isn't even going to be assembled at that point. It's gonna be parented to the body. <laughs> uh, so that's going to go all the way up there. Um, but will it appear alongside the rest of the head stuff? I think it will, but it will be at the very bottom of the head, yet at the height of the body. Um, so yeah, no, th that should be over here then. That should be over with the, with the rest of the body. Uh, I'll draw it in. Uh, tricky without colors, um, but it's just going to be a bit of a large mass shape. Uh, let's get the colors back and the tools back. Okay, uh, so neck, I'm gonna trace down through the collar. Being pretty crude with it. Uh, and around the head, like so. Filled with the body color. Get rid of the outline. And let's get to work on masking that in correctly. What do you reckon? It needs to be masked in by the shape of 
the body um, like that, um, specifically color out of the body um, with once again, uh, line art on top. So you can see a, f a bit of a formula appearing here. This, this approach of sort of stacking layers is exceptionally common. But then, oh, look at the controversy here. Um, so let's make sure that that's arranged in the right spot. Uh, so let's put that with the rest of the body and we'll put neck directly underneath that. Uh, and then we could probably even consider putting neck and body into a composite, which is gonna make all of it feel a lot more like just a, a unit. And whenever possible, that's our goal. We wanna try and keep things as modular as possible. When you've got just tons and tons of strings, just like overflowing the node network and there's just stuff going absolutely everywhere. It's very confusing and overwhelming to look at. Um, and although I'm not really using like excessive groups and things, I still feel like this is quite readable um, because although there's a little bit of crisscrossing happening here, it, it comes apart and it comes back together again very soon. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty concise what's going on. It's pretty modular. Um, so by being able to, you know, th this neck, like where this, like it started off like all the way over here, we managed to migrate it down until it's like just packed into this nice little, nice little unit here, um, which is pretty nice. Um, I'll probably even have, uh, I might even rename this actually. I might just call this, uh, yeah, I'll leave that called body, but I'll have another, one more tier uh, called torso. No, 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 I'm gonna call it body plus neck. That's a lot less confusing. Um, so there we go. There's a peg that will move both the neck and the body together, but you can get to their separate parts if you need to. Uh, and very, very soon, both of those will have envelopes as well. Uh, so that as the collar gets animated and moves around, um, we are able to adjust and move the height of that neck. And by default, I might actually have the collar um, parented, parented by that. Hmm, let's try it right now. Um, if, oh, that's a good idea actually. Um, sorry, a bit of an experiment. If these two were attached together like that, so that when I move the collar, it moves the neck color as well, we get this. Um, so it's always gray on top, always black underneath. Uh, and then I suppose you could get to the envelopes underneath if you really, really wanted to. Um, but I'm probably even going to um, omit this peg and just have it go straight from there to there. This would be one of the few cases where there isn't an independent peg to get directly to the collar and leave the envelope behind because you would go to that and sort of cancel it out in that at that point, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so therefore neck is going to be slightly one tier lower. And now that there is like a sub tier of pegs, I'm gonna select everything else and bump it up just a little bit. So we get a little bit more of a visual cue um, that this peg is on a slightly different tier to the other ones. I hope that makes sense. Um, all right, so meanwhile, uh, the collar also needs to be masked in with the body in a very similar way that the um, uh, neck is. So uh, now I could duplicate this cutter and perform a lot of the same actions again, but I just might be able to take this composite here, string it into there and combine these two pieces into one. Look at that. There we go. So the whole thing is now sort of acting as one unit. Very, very easy to control, which is great. Um, and we've considered before that we might split the tie and the collar into two pieces for a little bit more um, animation flexibility. Um, but this is now something really robust that an animator could even do on their own. They could add another layer in here and attach it to that point. Uh, and start doing deformers and all sorts of things. And it's all very, very versatile. Um, meanwhile, these two arms here, skip all of that junk, very, very clean route straight to the bottom. Uh, so all we've got left now is the uh, legs, um, which we noticed that we've got a um, pivot marker showing, uh, and we're gonna get rid of that very easily um, by simply not showing the overlay layer, right? Because it's up on a different tier. Um, so we, this is the only case where an auto patch is going to appear. 
uh, to connect that in with the uh, hips more cleanly. Uh, so let's think of how we're going to do that. I think we're going to use the, st the standard patching um, meta. Um, so I I've, I've got some in my library, but I'm sure I'm going to build a fresh one for you just for the for the heck of it. It's um, nice to practice remembering how to do it anyway. So this is the industry standard auto patching setup. Um, we have all four uh, sub layers existing um, with a cutter and an auto patch. So whole patching setup here. Um, I like to have a composite at the beginning first. Now the composite doesn't work well with the, um, doesn't play well with the auto patch. So like we'll get rid of that in a little bit. Um, but basically how it goes down is you have all of the sub layer splitters break apart and then immediately come back together again. And then you start sort of tearing it up and sending it off to different places, depending on where it's going and what it needs to do. Um, and the auto patch, meanwhile, uh, it sort of lives like up here a little bit. So it's like slightly above and treated a little bit differently uh, because the auto patch never goes down to its own composite. It always goes out to the cutter of its neighbors. Uh, so this cutter will receive the auto patch from something else, if that makes sense. Uh, so uh, how we're going to get that to work on this body. Oh, we're really starting to uh, blow out our uh, node view. Hey, uh, so let's get quite a bit more real estate going for these guys. Bit of playroom going. Um, so what we need here is we don't want an overlay, we don't want an underlay, so get rid of those. Um, and we simply want, um, now this leg isn't auto patching with anything else. Our body is auto patching the leg. Bang. Uh, put that in there. Um, hook that back down there. And there we go. Um, so, controversy time. The outlines of the shoe are messing with our body quite massively so. So we're going to need the majority of our um, outlines to actually exist on the overlay layer. Uh, so I'm gonna have to head back into this leg here and do a little bit of shuffling. Uh, particularly this uh, pivot reference. If I still want to get back to it, I might as well keep it. Um, but I'm going to actually, we're going to be using the overlay like in production now. It's not just sort of <laughs> sitting there as a reference thing. So I'm going to move that down to the underlay, which I know I'm still not going to use. Uh, and I'm going to copy this uh, and put it up on the overlay and get rid of the leg structure and just keep the shoe. Because uh, I'm going to be using this shoe. Uh, this shoe needs to overlap the leg, right? So that, that tongue there and everything, that still needs to show up regardless of whatever the auto patch is doing. Uh, so now that that exists up there, the whole leg exists here on the uh, line art, I should be able to get an overlay out. Pop that on top. Hey, there we go. Cool. All right, so there's your standard auto um, auto patching setup operating across uh, two different layers. Uh, everything's feeling pretty good. Don't need to do any auto patching on the back one uh, because I believe it is just sort of naturally like that. Uh, but now we have the benefit of being able to pick up this leg and swing it around. And you'll notice that once it goes back far enough, the shoe will always have its outlines, but the you know, leg doesn't. And again, f these legs likely won't be able to move at all, but it wasn't much work to be able to put that functionality in there should they require it. Uh, so I'm actually nearing the end of this process now. All that I, the next step is to put in the deformers that are necessary, but it's going to be pretty light on deformers, this guy, because uh, I'm going to be leaning so heavily on uh, doing frame by frame uh, where, where, where we do. Um, so envelopes and curves are what's going to be at play here. Uh, put in a fresh display so I can see this stuff um, cleanly. Or no, nah, maybe I should do what I did before and have this transparency. Uh, any, other 
Any other questions or thoughts at this point, by the way? I haven't been muted for the last half hour, have I? Golly, I hope not. <laughs> I think everyone's just starting to um wind down and fall asleep for the day. Hopefully me talking nonsense here hasn't been t causing too much brain fog. Uh, all right, let's see. I reckon this tail would probably benefit from having its bone up the top. Huh. Yeah, probably will need to be um, animated frame by frame as well from how flat it gets on the base. Uh, but I don't think that we see the tail ever move. So I don't need to get too full on with that. Same with the legs. We're embracing frame by frame there. Uh, body, however, is envelope time. Uh, I know a lot of people really like the auto-generate envelopes. I don't like it because I think placing your control points deliberately is very important. <laughs> uh, so three around the base. I'm likely going to need one right here on the neck. Um, and then three around the top of the head, like so. And then that one there, one on top of the belly, uh, one around near the crotch area, and then hook it back up here. Oops. Hook it back up there. Uh, and then another quick round through to tidy up the points. Ooh. That's not very tidy, is it? Not at all. Pull you in. Uh, twist. Yeah, so I always do two laps. Uh, one to sort of just get the points into the right spot and then another one to uh, get them nice and tight. Uh, and then always, always, always do a test because Roto, look at how the middle breaks there. So we may have to make the decision on, will that be masked in? Or perhaps I can just use a weighted deformer. And I think this character is light enough that we get away with using a weight. Uh, so the weight is wonderful. Um, it works. Uh, like this. It just makes textures behave, and it's wonderful. Um, they're not always advised because, see, see that? Now it's just working, so good. Uh, it's not always advised because they can be quite heavy, um, but in special use cases like that, um, yeah, really quite, quite useful. Um, so I'm a little on the fence here though, because I have a feeling the animator might like to access that strip and be able to like use a curve deformer on it up and down. Um, there's a couple of ways I could do it. I could separate it, I could mask it in and do all sorts of like weird stuff. Um, but again, this character is like so simple, right? So maybe um, it would be easier if I just did another one straight across like that. Um, And then, because you can combine weights, you see? Oops, uh, group, ungroup. And if it's set up like that, both of them can coexist. And it's really quite interesting, because you see like, see that? That's pretty cool. So I'm able to bend and move that piece around um, while still having access to this bit. So I might, might leave it like that. It's an underappreciated feature, that. Meanwhile, the neck, we have made its own independent piece. Independent piece. Um, and that will have an envelope basically around the whole thing. Uh, it can be a bit more rough though, because it's just about 
giving that animator enough control to be able to reshape and mold that if they find themselves in a jam. There we go. That's good enough. Now the collar is its own piece. Um, same deal, I think. Uh, I'm going to put its root above the tie and come back in this direction like so. So they can sort of like reposition that. Hmm. It really is doing some weird stuff to the tie, isn't it? I think I have no choice but to separate that. So uh, duplicate, I'll parent it to the collar for the time being. Head over to the drawing view. Uh, and for this one, I'll, um, let's see. I'll grab this point and pull it up so it's well inside there. And delete the points I don't need. What the heck is that? <laughs> uh, and then the color up for that is going to be very wrong. So I don't think I have much choice but to just do that again. across like so uh, and back on the original color we'll just delete that from both sub layers and that should be good okay that seems fine rename that to tie give it its own peg because everything needs a peg there give it a its own curve because why the heck not um, but I want that to follow that middle piece there so you're going to get a kinematic output flowing from the offset so that offset is going to Kinematic output there, flow to there, out the output through to you. There we go. Uh, so now I can grab the middle of uh, this tie, or I can grab. Oh, hang on. Oh, better idea. Better idea. Don't even need that. Um, they should all share one output, but go through kinematic first. Can I do that? Can I do that or will that be gross? That might be gross. Because um, <laughs> I want them all to share that one point, hey. But if I pull that one, see that's that's doing what I want where it's moving the whole thing, but uh, if it did that, then it's going to warp everything and be very weird. But that only does that side, and that only does that side. So I might have gotten myself carried away by needing to make the three points, because if that had a third one, that was this point. Like, is this stupid? This might be stupid. What if this curve just went straight from here to here, and we ditched that, um, and that went down there? Is that dumb? Yeah, that's dumb. <laughs> that's stretching things in all sorts of strange ways. See how it's breaking that bit of the tie? It's pulling in those those parts of the collar. So it's not quite what I wanted, but maybe I could just have it go down like that. And then... And then that connected. I think that did it. I think that worked. Some of that tie's a bit strange, the way it's bending the shapes, but it's not clipping on the collars anymore, and that's good. Um, it looks like I might benefit from just pulling up this central bit of tie a little bit to there. 
it's tearing a, quite a bit there, but does that show up in render view? It doesn't. Cool, we get away with it. Great. All right. Oh, that's a, that's a great solution. Uh, happy with that. All three of them share the same parent. Fantastic. Whoa! <laughs> that's so funny how it leaves the middle behind. Uh, all right, so that's how it needs to be laid below the collar. Um, but then we're good. We're good. That collar covers um, a lot of stuff that's really easy to control and move around. Pretty happy with that. Um, hopefully that's not too over-engineered to the point where it starts um, uh, causing confusion for the animator because it's the kind of thing that like, I feel like myself and other riggers get really excited about and we'll be like, oh, this feels so clever, but then it just sort of makes things more complicated for the animator later, but I'm pretty confident that's still simple enough that if they wanted to frame by fr frame by frame that tie, they they could, they could. I think, I think. Huh. All right, deformers in there. Um, now arms. I was still pretty confident that they don't need anything at all. I think they should be strictly frame by frame. Um, hair, however, I will. Um, but through what method? Because if I gave it three control points, one for each hair, that's a little bit overkill. It might be easier to just give it one point, but a curve deformer for that's no good. A free form might do it. Well, then again, maybe another weight. Another weight might be good. Hmm. Let's try that real quick. Um, see, this is where I start getting carried away on every project. <laughs> I start spending way more time than I should on clever solutions that are probably not actually helpful to anybody when they're much better off just having pegs and envelopes for everything because at least they know how it works um, and what they're going for. Uh, and then people like me come along who think they're being clever and trying to save people time when it's just making things more complicated as a result. Um, but let's see what happens. So this is a peg weight setup. And the idea is um, that it's sort of weighted at the base. So as you pull each hair around like that, you can see there's like a certain level of influence. Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's overkill. I'm probably better off just giving it three curves and calling it a day. No one's going to be annoyed at that at least. We all know how to work with them. Easy. Um, oh, the eyebrows have, have they lost their masking again? Yeah, they're back to being on front. They're meant to be behind the ears. Uh-oh. Ugh. Why not? It needs to be in front of the brow. The eyes need to be inside the head. The brow needs to be outside the head. But the brow needs to be on... But, the, but these need to be on top of the brow. So we've got like a bit of a conflict here. This is where things are getting really interesting. <laughs> you know, it's the old 80 20 rule isn't it where the last little bit is going to be the part that takes the longest i've saved a lot of time by not really needing to do anything on the arms and legs but the face is important that does need to be rigged a lot more properly so for the ears i have a choice 
normally that will need to be an envelope, but there's a lot of detail in there and they probably want to be able to grab the middle and shift that around and get some different things going. Um, I could probably use a two point constraint or a weight again, but it's probably, probably should be separate just in case. Let's have a look at the boards. I said, let's have a look at the boards. Yeah. Because what the face needs to do, that expression, so the ears go down quite a lot there. The brow crinkles in a ton. And this face here. That's the biggie. So how do I make the ears be capable of doing that? Should they be moldable into that position or should it just be a fresh drawing? I don't think there's much problem in me splitting it. It might feel a little over-engineered at the time, but we'll get a lot more flexibility out of it. And if I synchronize the layers too, then the animator can do redraws of it without any dramas. Um, it feels like the brow is our biggest puzzle for the day. How to get this line on top of that color art um, while still being masked in to the rest of here. I could have it be only masked on top, but then we would get a seam and seams are a big no-no. And I'm reaching the point now as well where it's hard to sort of think through it logistically while also, you know, commentating on it. But it'd feel weird if I just go into silence for 20 minutes while I sort of just like stare at the screen and think it through. Uh, if anyone watching is actually still awake and hasn't fallen asleep at their keyboard, I'm uh, definitely open to suggestions. Whoops. Because uh, this even shouldn't be that tricky. Ugh, I might turn to my sketchbook for a little bit and um, try and plan it out. Because uh, if that's masked in there, um, keeping the eyebrows separate might be one thing. Uh, should we take a break and do the ears? Just in case. Uh, hang on, let me have a look at these um, boards again. Because it looks like we might have a little bit of that ear interior show up on the other ear as well. So I should probably give this ear the capability of having one. Um, just in case. Because at the moment they're all one uh, layer. Um, so we'll give ourselves a bunch of different real estate. And on the plus side, there's, um, I've got about 45 minutes left and it looks like I might actually be able to complete this angle. Uh, there's still a front facing one to go. So they technically I only got about halfway through the project today, um, but I'm still pretty happy with that. Um, still need to test the dang thing, of course. Um, let's separate the ears. I think they will need to be separate. Uh, all right. So to do that, put a composite on the thing. Uh, I'm gonna duplicate it twice. Uh, name them accordingly. So uh, E F R uh, inner and E F tip. Let's duck inside for a little bit of surgery. Um, all right, so you only have your your color out to contend with, pretty much. That's fine. Uh, we just need to extend it. And how should we extend it? I think uh, we'll get rid of that and we'll generate some strokes from the edge. Um, no, it's not that one. Uh, uh, strokes to pencil lines. There we go. Delete that out. Uh, so we've recovered uh, our edges here. Um, and I'll add a couple of vertices onto the edge of each one so I can pull that out. Um, give that uh, an extra edge to what it had before. 
just sort of pull on that. Can give it a new edge. Complete the hump, if you will. Uh, Joey's back. They say, uh, what if I put another layer of the color art on a peg behind the head? The same peg could pull uh, two drawings, line in front, curl behind. Not a perfect solution, but dual. That sounds really good, actually. Um, I'll give that a go just after I um, finish patching up these ears. Um, so they'll also need a nice big cap on top. Hey, oh, <laughs> that cap I drew was too big. Um, it needs to be around the this size. That size seems seems all right. Oops, that's not what I meant. Grab you back over here. Um, all right. So that means we need one more arc. Like that, so it has lots of room to be masked in and move around. Um, meanwhile, the inner ear is gonna be way easier for us to craft. I just need to delete the parts I don't want, which is that bit and that bit. Um, and this bit, we can now fill with body secondary, get rid of the red, uh, and we're good. All right, ear surgery complete. Oh, except for this bit, which we need to go fill with uh, body main and ditch inner ear there. All right, now the surgery is finished. Um, both of these go into the composite. Both of them get their own pegs. Ear F gets a parent peg now. Our new pegs need pivots established. there oh looks like I didn't get rid of the line art there all good uh, and we need color art and line art of the ear main split across both of those a cutter and a second composite here so that both of those can be masked in to the color art of F uh, with, oh, whoops, <laughs> those go there and they're masked into that color art uh, with line art on top and color art underneath. Bang, there we go. Pretty straightforward. Uh, but now we have the flexibility of being able to Move that piece around uh, and it stays inside. Uh, and we can move around that piece as well. And just while we're here, because why the heck not, uh, we'll bolster that with the ability of um, being able to uh, deform it like that. What the heck? We already had a deformer. At least one waiting to be made. How bizarre. There we go. Place that there, place that there. Uh, so now this animator will have a ton of control. They can bend that all around and what have you. Um, as well as the ear itself, we'll need an envelope around the whole thing. Uh, there, 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 and there. There we go. I think that's a pretty decent amount of control at that point. So they can still get to the parent and sort of position and skew and mold all that around. Um, the inner ear, I suppose it could do with an envelope as well. So golly, we've gone from the most basic kind of ear to probably one of the more complex ones. You can really see how you can get uh, carried away just adding more and more components, more and more flexibility. Um, but you're always asking yourself like, where is that point of diminishing return? At, at what point is this like, 
too much? When will this slow an animator down and they were actually better off all along just drawing it, you know? Um, so rather than using this, um, uh, repeating the whole process on the back here, it's so similar that I could probably literally duplicate this entire assembly uh, and just flip it and put it back there and be done. Let's give it a go just before I, just in case. So hook you up to the head uh, and then flip, shift across um, and need to get a reference back on. transparency on too so we can see what the heck we're doing okay yeah this could work yeah I think we're good it is sits there pretty fine um, now I wonder it probably doesn't even need to be flipped actually because I think it was better off having its pivot on this side, although we have the freedom to move it. Um, let's put you, yeah, about here-ish. You need to be more inside the head. Um, and rather than deleting or moving this off the edge, I'm just gonna give it a blank drawing substitution. So this is the only time so far in the build that we've seen multiple drawing substitutions come into play. But rather than deleting the drawing, it means I can just have a little toggle here now to turn that on and off um, if I were to need it. Um, all right, so I think I've killed two bears with one stone there, which I'm pretty happy with. Um, sweet. All right, home stretch, I think. Um, I'm assuming that you only need the, the brows to move, otherwise you could play with the auto patch layers, um, which is more complicated. Honestly, you could do it with the line and color art nodes um, and not need the extra peg, just spitballing. Uh, they're all good suggestions. Uh, I'm gonna get into exploring it right now. Uh, and then we're pretty well there. It'll just be final testing, uh, bulking up the line weight for one thing <laughs> uh, and seeing how that looks. Uh, let's turn the references back off again. Um, and that off as well. Okay, so what was your first suggestion, Joey? What if you put another layer in the color art? Uh, wait, if you, if you put another layer of color art on a peg behind the head, the same peg could pull the two drawings, line in front and color behind. I'm not quite following, actually. Um, I do only need the brow to move. It doesn't need deformers on it. Um, but it likely will receive a number of redraws throughout the process. Um, so I don't want it to be too overcomplicated. I'm not sure where the extra pegs really come into it because it's like a, like it's a layering thing. The fact that this disappears under here but also disappears under there. Like if, if I put it on top of this one, it's gonna start bleeding out of that head as well, um, which isn't great. And the best thing I can think of right now is to have this uh, another thread of eye line art that is masked inside um, this color art, um, but it's gonna cause a seam. Like I'm just seeing it now. Um, I can show you what I mean if you've not really dealt with many seams before. Um, so if we get a color out and cutter out uh, where we have, where is brow? Where are you? Are you all the way over here? Um, if we had its color art um, mask uh, line art like this, not showing up either. 
Oh yeah, because the whole dang thing's behind still. <laughs> yeah, my brain's starting to get fried. Because if that gets turned off, it's popping out, but it's still not showing up on top of there either. So uh, let's just shuffle this around a little bit, see what happens. Um, so if that goes underneath, that goes on top. So it might just be as simple as masking out the head's line art from brow. Uh, let me try that first. Oh man, I was really hoping that would work. <laughs> um, oh wait, hang on. It's the other way around, isn't it? I'm stupid. Um, that needs to be cut by uh, color out of brow. Bang. Hey, we did it. That works well. Does it interact with that? And we're all good. Um, okay, so this expression uh, changes so extremely that I think we're much better off keeping that as a traditional thing. Um, I'll ask Mark about it. He might want me to give it a little bit more um, components, um, but I suppose we'll find out when uh, the animator who's going to work with this uh, is going to, um, you know, if they have a bit of a play around with it and see what they like and dislike. But otherwise, I think I'm done. I've got all the components in there that I need and it's not over the top. <laughs> uh, it's capable of doing the actions that this character needs to do. The arms are a huge nothing burger. They are ripe to be drawn. Uh, so it's going to be traditional arms and legs um, on top of essentially a fully rigged face, um, a semi-rigged body. So you can move that around as enough um, to be able to get like all your squash and stretch in there, get your envelope movement in there. Um, so, you know, I think we've hit like a, a pretty good balance. Um, of being able to animate this. Um, hopefully like squishing that around is moving that a little bit. Um, so I might get some notes on that. I'm not too sure, but I'll probably be quite open about where I think the shortcomings are and uh, get that sort of feedback. Uh, now I still need to do the front facing one, which is gonna probably be a little bit simpler, um, but I just need to sit down and grind out during, um, during some drawings of that. Uh, if you're interested in me uh, live streaming it as well, um, you know, let me know in the chat right now. I'll try and choose a more appropriate time of day so that you can be around for some of it. I'll try and uh, do like an hour in the morning before work um, throughout the week. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, um, but before I go, uh, I hear from uh, Valentine here saying uh, that I was missed. Yes, I miss being here. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that you noticed I was gone, I suppose. Um, where have I been? I, basically, I've just been working. So I do work full time and I have no real excuse because, you know, like anyone else who doesn't do YouTube for a living needs to somehow figure out uh, that balance of doing just a little bit on the side. Uh, but I am rubbish at that. Uh, so I'm glad to be back for a stream where I can just sort of be doing this live for a little bit. I mean, it took a public holiday to be able to do it. Um, but once I'm back in the flow, hopefully things will pick up a little bit. I have many videos that are like half finished. Uh, so there may be an influx of them. Um, there's a lot of things that got to like 80% finished before I had to like abandon them or cancel them. So I'm on the fence about whether or not I should finish those or if I should just upload them as is uh, to the Patreons as a bit of a perk because they've, you know, <laughs> those are people who are donating and they have just been left high and dry for like the last two or three months without any content at all. Um, so that might be worth looking into. Um, is this a rotating rig? No, it's not. Uh, this is a rig for a pilot that uh, he's an extra. He only appears for about five shots. Uh, so I'm making sure that it is not overkill that the amount of time that I'm spending building it is not going to overshadow the amount of time that it's going to take to animate it. Uh, so he appears at this angle for only about two or three shots and he appears at a front facing angle for a couple of shots as well. So this is very much embracing a hybrid nature. Arms and legs are like fully traditional. Uh, body is, you know, like a simple envelope and the head is fully rigged uh, so that you can get um, the amount of expression out of this that we need to. Um, and yeah, so hopefully best of both worlds. Um, 
Kind of like having few people uh, in the chat because you get more interaction. That's true, but uh, don't worry too much, Joey. My streams do not get very busy anyway. Uh, they'll probably, like at the moment, I'm seeing uh, 10 concurrent viewers uh, in the ticker uh, and it usually maxes out at around 30. Uh, so you can always get a word in. Um, the only thing that will change from what's happening here is that rather than being able to focus on a project, it will become even more interactive. I'd spend most of my time basically answering questions and doing little spontaneous tutorials based on those questions. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, one more comment saying, well, uh, that refreshed my memory as I, and I saw new things. Thanks for sharing with us. You're very welcome. Um, this is the hybrid rig, yes. Uh, so I think hybrid rigs are probably one of the best places to be. Um, I said this at the very beginning of the stream, but I think it's probably a good place to round out, um, is that there is very much a balance. Uh, there are a lot of rigs floating out there in the community right now, which are like your industry standard full turnaround rigs. Uh, and for people who are animating independently or doing short films, doing music videos, etc., it's usually way over the top. They take about a week and a half full time to build, uh, which is insane. Um, you get a lot of return on that investment if you're working on like a 20 episode series or something like that. But if you're just an individual animating for fun, that is a lot of work for probably not much in return. Um, you need to be thinking about, is this just going to be quicker if I drew it? Um, or would it have been quicker to do this in 3D? The whole benefit of this medium is that you can still draw things. Uh, and this character is built with that in mind this arm is going to get lopped off and just you know drawn with a traditional one all the way through that's the idea um, where do you fall on that spectrum how much drawing do you do to rigging so rather than spending um you know 80 hours per rig as you've just said joey um i've gotten this angle done from start to finish in just shy of four hours uh, which i'm pretty happy with and there's another angle to go so that's probably going to take us to about you know six seven eight hours um and, you know, so that right there, um, despite being such a simple rig for an extra, that's still a, f you know, one full um, working day uh, to build that. Uh, you know, it happens pre pretty easily. Uh, so, you know, to get a full 360 one around that has all of the all of the hand substitutions drawn in, has all of the mouth substitutions drawn in, um, you know, these eyes are just a pupil in a thing. Like if that had an upper eyelid, lower eyelid, the whole thing was deformer based. You, you build master controllers in there. Heck yeah, it very easily can become a one to two week job. Not to mention all of the notes that you're going to receive from, you know, supervisors, directors, creators, um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, there's, there's a lot to consider. There's a lot to consider, um, especially when a lot of it can be conceptual as well. Few occasions appeared on this rig here where um, we were thinking conceptually, what is the best way to build this? I'm expecting probably a few notes back on, on, on this guy as well. Um, different ways that we could have approached the problem. And I'm just trying to think of it from the animator's point of view. What's going to be the easiest tool for them to work with? Um, all right, so I think that... Uh, brings me to the end of this session. Uh, this is going to be up as uh, one long, you know, four, and, four hour video on the channel. Uh, so, you know, feel free to go back and just sort of flip through that timeline. It is basically a how to rig A to, a to Z, more or less. Um, I don't go into too much detail on all the theory, but there is quite a lot discussed at the beginning and scattered all throughout. So I hope you get something out of it. Not sure if I'll ever get around to editing it <laughs> this one will probably exist as is uh, so thank you so much for joining me i'm going to go have some dinner uh, so take care have a good night especially if it's coming on 4 a.m wherever you are bye bye